This conference so will now be recorded. Okay, I my think I'm not sure my audio is going in and out, so hopefully hopefully this sticks. But I can hear you guys now. Um, I think we've got about 40 people in the room, so we'll we'll skip introductions. But if you want to see who's here, um, you can you can check the attendees and um, you know, see see in that way. Our first presentation today is going to be from Mark Rochelle with Audubon, Florida. He's going to be talking about a recently completed restoration project that they did out at Sunken Island. So Mark, I'm going to turn the controls over to you. So my, can, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, and should I be trying to share because it's not allowing me to share? Just give me a minute, I'm trying. <laughs> no problem. All right, you should have the presenter option now. Okay. Does that look good? Yes. Uh, well, it's not, you're not in presentation mode yet. Okay. Okay, so I I, <laughs> I apologize. Which which button do I need to hit to do presentation mode? Do you have you do you see presentation mode on your screen and we are just not seeing it or? Um, yeah, it was full screen. It, did, did that work? No, I think you're going to need to switch which screen you're sharing with us. You have two. Do you have a two screen setup? I don't know. Well, otherwise you just need to kind of make it bigger for us to see if you can't. Can you go to slideshow at the tab at the top that says slideshow and try it that way? Yeah, I'll try it again. <laughs> I apologize. I guess I don't have any experience with go to. I guess uh, what, is everyone seeing? I guess where where am I? Is everyone just kind of seeing? Uh, what are we, you guys seeing? We see cool. your <laughs> we, see, we see your PowerPoint as if you were working in PowerPoint, but not in presentation mode. Okay, let me try that again. Did that did that fix it? No. If you go to slideshow at the top ribbon, where it says slideshow next to review. Okay. And then go um, from beginning or the far left. Right. So I can see it in slideshow photo on my computer, but I'll let you guys. It's which screen you're sharing, and it's not really worth trying to troubleshoot. Just I think okay. present from here is my is my suggestion. Okay. <laughs> well, I apologize. Um, so uh, yeah. So again, uh, thank you, Maya. Um, this is a. Um, a project for um, that we completed for the um, Tampa Bay Estuary Program, Restore America's Estuaries, um, Tampa Bay Environmental uh, Benefit Restoration Fund, um, and and it was for the vegetation control at um, Sunken Island in um, Hillsborough Bay on the Alafaya Bank. Um, so I'm Mark Rochelle with uh, Audubon, Florida. Um, and we manage a number of the waiting bird colonies um, around the central Gulf, Gulf, excuse me, central Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, that our official range includes from Levy down to Lee County. Um, we have a mix of coastal and inland colony sites. Um, we have colonial and solitary nesters. And then we also, um, for our management of those islands, we'd like to get at least one peak um, bird count 
and then do lots of habitat management. And one of those habitat management projects are um, vegetation control. So this is kind of, um, if you can see my screen, uh, kind of an overview um, of the um, places that we go out and kind of in the Tampa Bay area and um, try to hit at least once a year to make sure we um, get a count of the birds that are nesting there or to see if they're active or um, have become recently active. So I'll kind of drill down to the area where that we conducted the project, that's Hillsboro Bay, um, where we have the Alafia Bank. Um, so this is um, a picture of the Alafia Bank with bird and sunken island, sunken island being the western island. Um, those two big features uh, to the right, um, to the west, are the dredge boil um, deposit areas um, for the port and the core. Um, and then just kind of off screen, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but down here to the south is where we have uh, Green Key. You can kind of just see the label there, Green Mark, Key. Was, uh, yep. I don't know if my computer's laggy, but I'm there. Now you've got a map up. Is it is it a map now? Yes, now it's a map. Okay. Um, and so let me get back to my screen. Um, and so uh, Hillsborough Bay has been recognized as a, um, a, a global significant important bird area um, because of the Alafia Bank, um, the number of birds that nest there, the diversity of species, um, and then the longevity of the island. And so, you know, it's a, it's a um, area that um, Audubon has been working in for a long time. Uh, we got our start way back in uh, 1934. Um, and we started here at Green Key, which is the original bird island, and Whiskey Stump was the island that um, the, the original warden kind of camped out and, and protected Green Key. Um, I show this picture because we had a kind of a joint uh, control, a uh, vegetation control project that I'll talk about briefly, um, going with this um, T-BIRF um, grant, this Sunken Island Restoration Project. So just if folks aren't familiar, Green Key and Whiskey Stump Key um, are south in the bay, kind of near. This is um, um, the Mosaic property, Port property, and we have the Tico Power Plant here just to the south, so south of the Alafia Bank. And then, of course, we have the Alafia Bank at the mouth of the Alafia River. Um, so this project was specifically for the Western Island um, to do the vegetation control on Sunken Island. So. Um, the Alafia Bank is a dredge spoil island, so there are um, um, wetland areas where we have lots of mangrove forests, but we also have lots of upland um, that was that was dominated by Brazilian pepper, um, lead tree, uh, and other invasives. And so we kind of wanted to get that all cleared out so that we could have a more diverse um, habitat structure um, and, and, and something that would be uh, more beneficial to the birds that were nesting on the island. Um, so you can see we have these large mixed wading bird colonies, um, especially at the Alafia Bank, and that's what we were trying to promote. So, you know, we have reddish egrets, lots of white ibis, oyster catchers, um, and spoonbills. So that's kind of the background. It's like why, you know, that's why we uh, wanted to restore the island. Um, it's obviously a very important bird nesting island. Um, and this is uh, the, the funding provided the house. So um, we were funded in 2019 um, and faced many delays. Um, and so I'm showing this picture because in addition to the vegetation control project that we have going on at the Alafia Bank, we have um, our very large or long um, breakwater that was placed just offshore of Sunken Island and Bird Island. And so we were, um, this was kind of a, a project that was funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and Gulf oil spill money um, that we had applied for and hoped to um, install sooner <laughs> than uh, 2019, 2020, but that, that's how everything worked out. And it overlapped with the timing of this project. Um, and of course, um, the reason we're on Zoom, um, or excuse me, go-to meeting having technical issues is that COVID hit soon after the completion of this this project and so um, initially our plan was to go out with our contractor um, take out a little machine um, and um, use the machine to kind of mulch everything in place 
at the uh, at Sunken Island, all the non-native vegetation. Um, we had something worked out with our contractor with the barge, and that fell through. And then again, COVID hit, and we um, and we faced all kinds of delays. So I, I want to make sure I thank Elsa and all the uh, um, Restore America's Estuary staff that worked with us um, for the extensions that were required. Um, in addition to those, you know, unexpected delays um, each nesting season, because the Alfia Bank has so many nesting birds, and it is a critical, excuse me, FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife designated critical wildlife area. There is a closure. Um, during which we can't do any work. And so there was this seasonal bird nesting closure that really limited our time out in the island. So all that said, we, um, we, we were able to kind of get things going and get things together. I want to mention that we did concurrently have another vegetation control project um, funded by EPC of Hillsborough County uh, through a PRF grant for the um, non-native removal of vegetation at Whiskey Stump and Green Tea, which is, again are the two um, original Audubon bird islands south um, in the bay. And then at the bird island, which is the second island of the Alafaya Bank. Um, in addition, we were able to fundraise um, through Audubon donors, um, the local um, Founders Garden Club, we had Tampa Audubon and other volunteers come out and help us um, at various stages during the project. And then of course the Mosaic Company um, provided a lot of match for the work that we were doing out there. Um, for folks that aren't familiar, the, the Alafia Bank is owned um, by the Mosaic Company and um, Port Tampa Bay and, and Audubon um, has a long-term lease to manage it as a bird colony. So after uh, many, many delays and, and different um, plans, we decided um, the only way to get the work done was to do um, handwork. And so um, we had crews go out um, and treat with saws and, and machetes and treat everything by hand and pile it up and, and use herbicide um, to treat the vegetation. So you can see um, the crews working here in the middle of this shot. Um, and it was pretty dense Brazilian pepper um, forest in there that um, these guys had to work through, but they did a, did a great job um, of working through, again, cutting and piling the material. Um, you can kind of see this aerial shot here of the work progressing. Um, and you can see the piles that are starting to form um, on the island where uh, we had complete coverage by Brazilian pepper, and it's now been opened up nicely. Um, so we, there are a number of native species that are out there, cabbage palms, um, some Florida, good size Florida privet. Um, but again, they did a great job of um, clearing the island. So this is an aerial view um, of the before and after the work. Um, and you can see kind of the contours here, what, what was left behind the, um, the mangrove forest, kind of on this um, end of Sunken Island. Um, through the middle here and then the eastern tip. Um, but everything else was, uh, again, treated, hand cut, dragged, and um, piled up um, and, and herbicide um, treated. So um, I think our original metric in the, the grant was to clear about 15 acres and the, um, the contractor did about um, 17 plus. And so they um, were really um, happy and, and grateful for uh, Stantac and their crews um, that went out and, and really got, you know, from the tip to tip of Sunken Island completely treated. So the original plan was to do a, a initial treatment, uh, hand cut and piling, and then come out and plant and then follow up with um, um, retreatment cycles. <laughs> um, but um, because of that closure period, um, we had pretty aggressive regrowth, um, especially of the vines um, and, you know, some of the pepper and the lead trees that came in pretty quickly um, after they did that initial treatment. So we were, um, again, excluded from working on the island for about six to eight months. Um, and then when we came back, this was uh, what we were greeted with uh, on the island. So we decided to do um, our initial retreatment to clear all the area up to get it ready for the planting. And of course, planting um, presents uh, logistical difficulties when you're planting out in the island, um, but we uh, were able to make it work with a couple of Audubon boats and, and Stantec and um, 
kind of a little um, dinghy here that we filled up with plants um, at the Williams Park boat ramp and then transported out to the island. Um, we had lots of help from volunteers. Um, you know, uh, you hear about that last miles in delivery. Um, they, you know, the volunteers were great. Um, again, unloading all the plants onto the boats, transporting, and then landing on the island and getting those um, plants in place for um, helping the contractor to um, install install many of these plants. And so, I, I, again, um, because we were able to raise additional funds, um, we planted about 1,200 um, native plants. Um, they were Florida privet, sea grape, um, buttonwood, and cabbage palms throughout the islands. Um, and so you can see here um, kind of the technique that we had employ. Uh, this was that vine coverage, again, that we came out and retreated before the planting. You can see the contractor got great, <laughs> great kill of that vine. Um, um, but it was existing, so we just kind of went out, um, dug holes, cut away any kind of uh, regrowth that was near the plants, and um, and and got our planting done. And so I, I wanted to show this picture because um, we were um, in the grant. We said we would retreat about 10 acres. Again, we we um, initially treated about um, 17. Um, we replanted about 10 acres, and then you know the rest we thought you know because there were um, existing um, native plants out there that they would kind of, you know, uh, flourish in the environment where they're not being completely choked out by the lead tree and pepper. In addition, those mangrove fringe here, this is an example along the shoreline, um, the mangrove forest would be able to <clears throat> expand um, out um, beyond the borders they were restricted by the, uh, the invasive plants. And so this is just um, um, kind of an aerial view uh, of the restoration area, um, showing that the birds did come in and use it. So, you know, this is just a, just a Google Earth image, but you can see, the, you know, the pretty uh, distinct signature of um, pelicans in the trees here, the white dots. Um, you can see them in the existing, <clears throat> excuse me, larger vegetation. They nested along those uh, piles. They, they just really love that pepper. They just can't give up that pepper. So they, they nested um, it within among the, uh, the piled up cut peppers, but also, um, again, among the uh, vegetation that we had freed up and cleared. And so um, we were very happy that the birds weren't deterred by their kind of new, um, their new nesting habitat. And, and we, we really are um, excited about how um, things will look in the future and will work in the future once everything is uh, restored on the island. So just as an overview, um, uh, we did treat, again, over 17 acres of invasive vegetation on the um, sunken island. Um, we conducted two follow-up treatments, one before the Mark, can you unmute yourself? There you go. Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I apologize. I did. There's there's somebody on the phone that has their audio on, and so I'm trying to trying to get it so that there's not Got feedback. Got it. Um, again, we had the uh, the kind of the concurrent. Um, vegetation control in Hillsborough Bay that we were um, working on Green Key, Whiskey Stump Key, and Bird Island of the Alafaya Bank. And then um, going forward, we have secured additional funding um, because you, you saw how much uh, regrowth we, we um, experienced um, of those vines and non-natives. We have secured funding through a Tampa Bay Estuary Program mini grant and the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay um, to hire, again, uh, uh, professional contractors to go out as soon as the nesting is done and um, continue the retreatment so that we can um, we can ensure that um, all those plants that we did get out there um, survive and, and, and flourish on the island. So that's uh, that's everything uh, that, that I had today. Again, I apologize for the, uh, the technical issues. Um, are there any questions? No worries, Mark. The slides are also up on um... You know they're linked on the website and they're available on that Google Drive, so folks can folks can check 
check it out there too if they weren't able to get it in the detail that they wanted here. Um, we have plenty of time for some questions. You can either type them into the chat or um, just let me know if you have a question. I think maybe Mark Schrammick has a question. You can just unmute and ask Mark. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Good deal. Okay. Um, I've had numerous laptop issues this morning. So, uh, Mark, great presentation, real good project. I like to see uh, restoration activities throughout Tampa Bay. And are you aware that uh, Corps of Engineers Jacksonville District is having the Tampa navigational study that's going to, it sounds like, result in quite a bit of um, beneficial use material? Do you think Audubon might be um, amenable to perhaps utilizing some of that for the creation and restoration of ideally tidal habitats, um, which would also sort of serve to um, provide habitat for birds as well as fish species? I, I do. I, I Yes, I'm 100 percent. So, um, you know, I, I am familiar with it and, and I agree with that. So, you know, one of the things that's kind of popped up in my head, um, I work with the uh, Reddish Egret Working Group um, and, and I feel like the, the Reddish Egret have lost, you know, a, a lot of that habitat, that shallow um, seagrass, mudflat habitat where they need to forage. <clears throat> Excuse me, because our our reddish egrets, we used to have, you know, 50 to 60 pairs of reddish egrets at Alafaya. I think we had three pairs last year. Um, and, and you know, the habitat, the nesting habitat is there. I think they've lost quite a bit of their, their foraging habitat. So I, I, um, I absolutely think that that would be an important um, part of that, that beneficial use. Um, they, they have a lot of material, millions <laughs> of cubic yards. And, um, and so, you know, we floated some ideas about the big spoil islands, about um, some um, restoration there for oyster catcher habitat. Again, we had, you know, 80 pairs of oyster catcher, hab excuse me, 80 pairs of nesting oyster catchers in Hillsboro Bay. We're down to about um, 15 or so. Um, so, you know, we're, yeah, we're absolutely, we're, we're excited about that. And, you know, hopefully we can, um, you know, I, I don't know when it's <laughs> early enough for the core. You know, it always seems like we try to get in there and they kind of move ahead without us. But um, no, we, uh, we we're absolutely trying to trying to make that work. Very good. And I, you know, I, I am working with the core to try and identify beneficial use areas throughout Tampa Bay that I think would probably be, you know, ecologically um, productive. Certainly, Alifaya Banks, I think, would be right, particularly hit on a, a high point for me, seagrass and or mangrove habitats. Um, and I think we certainly should consider climate change and sea level rise implications in the future also. But um, great, great, great work. Great presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <clears throat> Mark, I got a question for you. Yes. Um, are you are you doing follow up uh, control of your non-native vegetation? Are you doing maintenance? <clears throat> and then number two, uh, do you have an estimate of your survival survivorship of all the plants you installed? So, um, yeah, so we did, we, we, um, we did, we'll do follow up um, maintenance for these, for, for the Alafaya Bank and, and, and um, the Hillsborough Bay Islands. We have um, the Tampa Bay mini grant and the community foundation for this follow up for this fall. And so we'll have professional crews, you know, hopefully one day we'll reach the point where we don't need uh, professional crews out there to do the work, you know, maybe some volunteers and Audubon staff. Uh, but, but yes, no, absolutely. We're going to be, you know, going out as soon as the nesting season is over to, um, to conduct that, that follow-up maintenance. Um, and then with respect to the um, uh, survivorship of the, the plants, we, we did see really good survivorship. So we had about, um, again about 1200 plants and then um, when we went back um, kind of as a follow-up to the plants and then with the follow-up uh, maintenance event we had about 85 we walked transects along the the island we had about 85 to 90 percent survival um, for our plant so we uh, we got again it, it's hard because we're pushed out of the rainy season which is also the nesting season uh, but we did get some nice rains that um seem to to help with the with the plants there and um so yeah so right now we have we have good survivorship and again once the nesting season mm -hmm. is officially over out there we'll go out and uh and, and do the same okay thank you very much really nice project looks great <clears throat> thank you Thanks, Mark. 
Just a quick comment. Um, I love to see that you're engaging community members in, in the project and in the planting. Um, just a reminder, if you ever need any additional volunteers at the estuary program, we do um, partner with organizations around the watershed to hold these give a day for the bay events. Um, so I'd love to partner with you to help to plant some plants out there with our community members. So just keep me in the mind in mind in the future. Okay, great. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it's, um, um, yeah, yeah, we, we, I'll definitely I'll talk to you about that. Thank you. Awesome. Marcus, I didn't know if you wanted to tee this one up or if you wanted me to. The, the next yeah. presentation is Mike Wessel. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll tee it up. Um, I don't want to steal Mike's thunder on this, but uh, we're kind of launching a, a, a new project looking at how we can sort of operationalize the uh, information from our habitat master plan. Uh, so, you know, if you guys have been with us for the last couple of years, you know that we've recently updated our habitat master plan uh, and that kind of paves the way forward for um, how we, we plan and scope restoration projects or conservation efforts in the watershed as well as the subtitle habitats. And so it's an impressive um, piece of literature that, that lays that plan out. Um, but what we're trying to do moving forward is develop a scorecard or some sort of reporting metric that really operationalize, operationalizes the data and information in the habitat master plan so that we can get a sense of each year how well we're doing towards meeting our our 2030 and 2050 targets for that and so um this is kind of a new project like i said and uh, i'll let mike kind of explain um some of the initial scoping where we're thinking about for for doing that so um i don't know if there's anything else to add but i think that kind of summarizes it there Mike, you have presenter controls. Do you need Do you need help, or have you got it? Uh, can you not see my screen? No, you were sharing, and now it's gone. Really? Okay. Um, how's that? Yes. But same as before, we're seeing. Um, now we'll present your view, getting closer. There we go, <laughs> perfect, you got it now. Is that working? Okay. Yeah, you got it. All right, thanks. Well, um, as Marcus said, this is just um, an introduction to um, you know a, a project that we're doing for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, just providing a little bit of technical support to develop a habitat restoration scorecard. Um, and uh, a lot of work has been done and it should be a pretty simple, thing to do, but there are just a couple of complexities to it that um, make it a bit of a hurdle to, to synthesize into something that's really easily um, distributed to the public and, and, you know, just visualizations mostly. So today we're just going to present uh, some initial concepts and then we're going to be coming back to you guys over the summer for more input as we, as we move forward. Um, the goal is to really just to present, um, you know, develop a reporting tool to succinctly characterize progress towards these uh, restoration targets and goals that have been developed. Is it okay? Yep, it's good. Okay, okay. Um, the targets and goals that were developed as part of the, the Habitat Master Plan update um, for, the, for the estuary program. And, we, we want it to be consistent with all the other work products that the estuary program puts out and you've um you know you've seen the water quality report card and the nectin index and and the benthic index all these other um workflows that summarize uh all of the great work that um that you guys are doing um and so we want this to just you know be another um a, a, another reporting tool uh in line with the ones that already exist you know, the stoplight graphic that's uh, associated with the water quality report card is something that's kind of an ideal for us where we have a red, yellow, green. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to um, incorporate all the information that goes into all the different habitat elements into something like that. Uh, there's also this two page style document format that we're kind of considering as a way to present the material. 
Um, but it's, you know, we need it to include the current status. So how many acres of a particular habitat we have, and then how that reflects relative to our, our targets and our, our long-term goals. And so we need kind of a, uh, a trajectory of you know how you're doing relative to those targets and goals over time and and again as i said easily interpretable by the public and and integrated into existing workflows which means in r and you know all that open source stuff so um as marcus said we have a lot of information already we have an existing dashboard that i'll show you um a little bit about you know we have the Habitat Master Plan update. And, you know, we've got some really cool restoration story maps up on the web uh, and a restoration best practices manual. So if you guys aren't familiar with these things, it's all up on the website and uh, really easily accessible and, and really a lot of great information. And we're just trying to add to that in even a more distilled fashion, um, you know, for the, the um, attention deficit people like myself uh, to distill. So um, there, you know, there's there's basically on the website, there's these three tabs um, and they, you know, so you can um, uh, view the overall progress or you can view the land use change dashboard, which is something that Marcus has already, you know, uh, come up with. And the analysis workflow tab uh, leads you to the GitHub page where you have all the open source tools to replicate all of those calculations. And I'll, I'll just argue that the over, view overall progress tab is kind of we're going to probably be replacing what is there now with what we're um, what we're proposing to do over this summer. So uh, right now, what's in that tab is really um, just a table of the of the targets and the goals. So this is just for the um, inner. I don't know why it says subtitle. Inner title, I think, is uh, habitats. Uh, so that's my bad there. But um, this is just the acreage. Um, you know, the current extent the total restoration opportunity, the 2030 target and the 2050 goals, and then a narrative associated with these things. And, you know, this is this is static, but the current extent is going to change over time. Right. Um, the goals and the targets will not change, um, but the restoration opportunity might change as well. And so um, we can use this information that we have that was part of the Habitat Master Plan update and all the work that went into that to kind of estimate how we're doing against our targets and goals. And, and that's really the, the objective of, of what we're trying to, to get at. Um, the, the dashboard is uh, the other tab on the website, which is you know, very cool and uh, has this slider bar that allows you to uh, select any year within the time series between 1990 and 2020 and, and estimate the change in land use for these land use categories um, for any given you know year set within the uh, within the time series so that goes all the way to 2020 so so all these calculations you know how we're doing um, are, are already generated based on the stuff that Marcus has done so you know he's done a lot of the um, hard work uh, you know to generate these estimates which includes you know getting all the information and bringing it in um, it's really um, just a matter of, you know, distilling it down into something like this, if we can, or at least kind of a two page document where we have this red, yellow, green. This is the water quality report card. Um, and, you know, how we go about doing that. And, and we started messing around with it a little bit, um, you know, very little bit, but it gets it, it gets comp complicated pretty quickly. Um, so the potential components that we have are, you know, basically the land use classification stuff that comes out every couple of years, the Florida Natural Lands Inventory, the GIPRA reporting. Um, you know, we have to consider losses to, to development and, and climate change. Um, that's part of our charge um, over time. And, and that will come out of the data to some extent from the land use classification stuff, but what we, the real struggle in my mind um, is the future projects, you know, how we account for things that are on the books but haven't been implemented yet. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, 
um, I showed you the table of the targets and the goals and the current status. And, and so, you know, we, we have that information. We know what our current extent is, say, for 2020, which is our baseline. And we know what our goal is for 2050. And it's easy enough to calculate that rate um, to, you know, that we need to accumulate in order to get to our goal. This would be for salt marshes by 2050. It's really easy, you know, to do that, and we can do that without any, you know, input or any more work or anything like that. But the question is, you know, the way restoration occurs is it might be flat for, you know, a decade, and then we get this big bump in um, accumulation of a, of a restoration site for a particular um, type of habitat, and then it's flat for a while, and and then we get a, another big chunk. It's not, you know, just some linear function, and then. So how do we go about, um, you know, accounting for the fact that, yeah, we might be under our rate, our, you know, expected target if we're going to meet our goal, but we know that, you know, there's a big salt marsh restoration project coming online and, and you know, what kind of, you know, data are there to support that and how can we um, incorporate that? And so that's, in my mind, that's kind of the lift um, but we could create, you know, a, a, a graphic like this for every habitat element. I think there's 15. So then you got 15, uh, you know, graphics and that becomes kind of unwieldy in and of itself. So we're kind of talking about, you know, what kind of graphics can we use that incorporate multiple habitat types for, you know, say subtitle or intertidal habitats. Um, and again, you know, we're looking at this red, yellow, green, and Marcus and I kind of just talked about, well, you know, what would a red category look like? And it might be that you're, you know, below the target, so you're under here, say in 2024, and you have no expectation that any restoration is gonna be occurring, so you're really not on track from a planning perspective to meet your 2030 target or your 2030 goal. Again, the challenge is, you know, how you, you know, where is that information coming from? Do we have enough information about restoration planning to be able to, you know, do that? Or can we just even qualitatively say, you know, can we go just ask some people and say, hey, are we, you know, do we have any projects coming up or, or whatever? But so these are kind of the four categories that we're looking at right now is below but not on track below, but we know that some restoration is coming online um, or above, but we don't see anything out in the future that's going to um, hold us to our to our rate that we need to accumulate. And then, you know, our green is mangroves. <laughs> you know, we already, already know we, we've got plenty of mangroves and and, um, and they'll be accumulating over time probably. So, um so that's kind of what we're looking at. This is these are the next steps, or really just to receive any comments on today's um, you know presentation. If it stimulated any great ideas for how to present um, these kinds of um, summary tools, or if you know something from some of your other work, please send it to Marcus or I, um, or both. Um, you know, we're going to be working internally over the summer to to define some more concepts. Um, and then bring it to the next TBP HRC meeting, which I'm not sure when that is, but I'm assuming it'll be kind of maybe late summer or something like that. So we'll be talking to those guys more. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I mean, it, it could be really simple. It's just, there's just a couple of things that I think, um, a couple of hurdles that we just kind of have to figure out how to get over. And that's what I've got for you. So this is one of those things that we're explicitly looking for your feedback on, whether it's how to treat the thresholds for how to bin things, red, yellow, or green, or what you think would be useful from this product. Um, but if, if you don't talk for this one, we're going back to in-person meeting. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey Dave. Hey, um, it's not exactly related to this, but you know, one of the things that we're kind of thinking is, you know, we we've got versions of like the, the models and how different habitats are going to respond to sea level rise. And um, what I've seen in the past is these models basically have like, you know, a category of mangroves. We will have ma more mangroves. And uh, I think it's a little bit more subtle than that. Uh, Jay's uh, taken me to a couple of sites where it looks like a red mangroves, 
are going to be able to maybe uh, jump over the tops of seawalls. We're seeing our prop roots come up. Uh, black mangroves, I'm not sure black mangroves can handle you know, even a couple of inches of sea level rise in some places. So I kind of think just as you work through this, maybe an opportunity to kind of put a little bit more detailed effort into looking at the category of mangroves. I'm not sure black mangroves are going to be able to handle sea level rise as easy as red mangroves will. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, we've noticed, at least in Sarasota Bay, that uh, the mangrove fringes that we have on the outside of seawalls are a big part of the mangrove shoreline we have in, in certain areas, particularly in the southern part. Uh, and they're not mapped. Uh, they're, they're just, they're not picked up. And so uh, if we don't pay a little bit more attention to the mangroves on the outside of seawalls in areas where they're not forming a 500 foot thick, you know, uh, forest, uh, then we may actually not be paying as much attention to them as we need. So again, it's not directly related to this, but as you move forward, you might want to just look at the model a little bit more detail and, and maybe differentiate between the ability of reds and blacks to handle sea level rise and also find out whether or not you're adequately capturing mangroves in urban settings that are on the outside of seawalls and how they might be particularly susceptible to sea level rise. And that's it. Thanks, Dave. Crusade, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. Um, I, can you guys hear me okay? Sort of. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in a noisy environment, but I, I just had a quick question about those trajectory figures. And, and I'll use salt marsh as an example because that's that's the one that we kind of spent some time on. You know, and, and to build on what Dave just said, so there we know that mangroves are becoming, you know, more and more abundant. So as we move forward, from time step zero through this period, are we adjusting that initial acreage to account for the probable loss in salt marsh acreage as we move uh, through time? Yeah, right. Um, that's that's a good question, and that's a that's a good uh, aspect to consider as we move forward in this. I mean, we do have potential losses as as, um, as one of our um, metrics that were you know an input into this um, but um, yeah I mean <clears throat> for a situation like that or losses to sea level rise or climate change we're going to need to figure out you know how that affects the rate as you move forward Chris are you talking specifically about the target and goal acreages set well how you or get just back to the it. Extent? of the specific habitat. Yeah, I'm just I'm talking about it more from a tracking standpoint. Like if our if our goal is to gain X number of acres of salt marsh per year and we hit that and we make that target, but we've ended up losing more just to conversion to mangroves. Is that something that that will I think we need to pay attention to that, I guess, because we can we can then develop perhaps a misleading conclusion that we reached our our acreage goals but if behind us we lost however many acres to mangroves I, I, d that probably needs to be accounted for either on the front end with changing that initial time zero uh estimate or more more appropriately probably changing the goal and saying well yeah you know this is 5,000 acres was our target in 2020 but we just lost a thousand acres over the last five years so now our target needs to be 6,000 that does that make sense yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And I think, you know, from the baseline of where we're starting in terms of the 2030 and 2050 targets are relative to extents in 2020 right now. So we're trying to build, not lose those current extents. Um, and when we do this reassessment using the land use, land cover information, I think we'll have adjustments in each of the uh, different habitat categories, but really where we might be seeing like lost uh, areas of restoration opportunity is in the opportunity areas and once the opportunity areas start diminishing below the total habitat extents plus the targeting and goals that's when we're in trouble so we're losing areas to restore these habitats too and, and i think that's a, an important component that we're looking to update periodically whenever new land use land comfort land cover information comes out yeah ed i i couldn't agree more and you know i'm not suggesting that we try to come up with some updated number without real data like the land use land cover maps but i think it's important 
as we use this as a tool, and I think this is a great tool, um, that there's some narrative that goes along with it to caveat these targets uh, may change in the future as we understand how these habitats are changing and opportunities change. I think that's a really important one, and we have the we have we have the opportunity to really bring that message home. When you're talking about things like uplands or coastal fringe habitat in Tampa Bay, you know, okay, we got a goal, but how are we going to attain it? So I think all that can be built into the the narrative that goes along with the tool. Dave? Uh, yeah, so I think we're, we're kind of ping-ponging back and forth, Chris and myself, but I think there's one of the things that uh, strikes me is the habitat conversion is is already occurring at a large scale. And uh, here's a great example. If you're coming from uh, Sarasota, driving up to Tampa, and before you get to Ellington, before you cross the Manti River, there's that big open area to the right-hand side. Uh, it's called Cypress Strand. Well, there's no cypress trees there, but it used to be all black needle rush. And with little tiny scrub mangroves, it's almost mangroves with hardly any black needle rush. You can't see any black needle rush, no juncus uh, there at all. Uh, there's still some there, but I mean, that's happening quickly. And, you know, we may have been saying, well, you, know, you have to wait for sea level rise. I'm not sure exactly sea level rise versus temperature change, but we've looked at our Sarasota temperature data and we used to average two to three freezing days per year. We've had three freezing temperatures in the last decade. So I think the, the manatee, excuse me, the mangrove expansion at the, uh, you know, into areas that used to be uh, marshes is happening quicker than we thought. And it's not, you know, something that's gonna happen in the year 2050, it's already happening. So I think just, you can have all your categories, but I think there are changes that are happening right now uh, that are pretty, pretty extreme. And look in that one area and, and it's every bit as dramatic as what you see up in the Homosassa River. Yeah, that's actually the example that I I use too. Um, like when I'm giving presentations, you can actually use Google Street Map Street View to show the change over time. And you know, I've been making that drive my whole life since I was a little kid, and it's definitely a very noticeable change to me too. But I think that's sort of the the point of what we're trying to do by distilling this product at more frequent time steps is to be able to move this out of just the anecdotal things that that we are able to observe and, and give it in this report card format more regularly than every 10 years so that we kind of have an idea of one, whether our targets are you know, true or not, or you know, where we need to make up extra ground to get to those targets that we've set for ourselves. And so on that, on that note, I guess I kind of think that trying to account, like I get that it's not a linear relationship the way that the restoration activities are going to work, that you're going to have these big jumps, but I don't think that we need, I don't think it makes sense to try and predict what, what projects are coming down the pipe, because if you're currently not at a level where you're meeting um, the acreage goals for a particular habitat type, then you need to be providing evidence that encourages people to pursue those kinds of restoration opportunities where it makes sense. So, um, you know, having something in the red is okay if you can use that as a tool for justifying the types of restoration projects that you need to be pursuing. So, um, that's my take on trying to predict future projects. I don't know if others have thoughts on that. Hey, my, my, I, I wonder, I want to go back to something Mike and, and Marcus said real quick about possibly looking at these as habitat assemblages and coming up with targets based on not just a single type, but maybe a coastal, you know, mangrove salt marsh habitat. Because, you know, obviously we don't restore habitat to just one species. We're, we're looking at restoring a mosaic of habitats, as Brant likes like to say. Um, is there a way to do that? And, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the plan in front of me. I don't remember how that was presented, but maybe that's a, a, a better broad brush metric that we can create like a stoplight chart for. Yes, they are grouped. Um, they are grouped into like subtitle, intertitle, supertitle categories like that. But but the targets are are habitat specific, and I I mean I, I hear what you're saying, Chris, and I, I like that concept because you know painting that broad brush addresses multiple different habitat types as the mosaic. But at the same time, I don't want to detract from the value of what's in the existing HMPU of the targets for each specific habitat type. So you know different strokes, I guess. But but I don't yeah. want to you know 
distract from what's already, I think, a good precedent for what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I, I was just thinking that from a, a planning tool, it, if there's a way to maybe capture that more as a, a habitat type as opposed to a single species or a single assemblage of species. And I, I don't know if Brant's still on, but, you know, I, I think when when we in SWIM do habitat restoration projects, a lot of times we don't know what those acres are going to look like. So planning a project, we say, hey, there's a parcel. It has a lot of potential for intertidal habitat. What that really is going to look like, we really don't know. So that that's just where I'm trying to see how we could tie this tool into, um, you know, I mean, into literally trying to justify uh, land acquisition or restoration on on public lands or private lands for that matter. I think those are good points. And Brant, before you jump in and, and give your thought, there, there is actually one target that is expressed as total intertidal habitat. So it is a, a mosaic, uh, both uh, target and goal for those specific habitats. But I think we can bro more broadly potentially apply that for the subtitle and supertidal habit habitats as well. Ed, I don't have a lot of extra things to add other than, you know, Chris brought up the idea of um, land acquisition and, of course, habitat mosaics. And those are two things that I've pushed my whole career. Um, personally, I think the salt marsh goal that you guys have set is is really high. I don't think it's going to be as achievable. I think our salt marshes, as you guys have already pointed out, are disappearing. They're being replaced by mangroves. Uh, possibly if we continue to work our way up the watershed, we'll get some more of those lower salinity marshes and stuff. But the, the handwriting's on the wall. You know, we're losing our salt marshes. And I mean, a couple of years ago, there were people uh, that were advocating we go out and pull up the mangroves. And I'm going, this is idiocy. We're not going to go out and pull up all the damn mangroves just to save the salt marsh. It's not going to happen. So <clears throat> anyway, that's my two cents worth. Well, and, and Brant, you know, along those lines, too, going back to the, the goal, um, and, and again, this is common practice for us in SWIM, if you're, you know, we put down plants like Spartina patens, Alterniflora, Bakeri, not with the intent that those are going to be static salt marshes that will live on forever, but more than likely we acknowledge the fact that a lot of these salt marshes are going to turn to mangroves, and we've got tons of examples of that. So yeah. we can put on paper hey, we, we restored 1,000 acres of salt marsh this year. But the reality is in five years, you'll be lucky to have half of that as salt marsh. So does that come off the, the rolls or do we just you know, no, keep it as a restoration target? That's one of like the complicating factors too is you know we're doing one thing where we're tracking using land use land cover. And so it gets mapped one way, but then we're reporting progress through GIPRA and, and the way that, you know, the, the you know the acreage for a restoration project but the way that that then like ripples through into how it's mapped over time you know changes and so how to reconcile those two things in a way that's meaningful and coherent not just for us even but for a you know regular public audience too i think is kind of complicated and we ought to think a little bit more about that so i'll i'll say that at the end of this effort we'll get a product it won't be you know the best product to cover all of the bases that we're discussing but i think we want to try to get to a point where we have something that is um more informative than what we have uh and the last point i want to make about that is you know what, what i think a lot of people don't realize about the stoplight graphics is is yes it distills information into a very simple diagram of good fair poor but what those colors mean i think is is a little more nuanced how you get to those scores and, and that's what i think the is the crux of this project is how we define those color categories what is the algorithm or the rubric we use to to base those colors off of and and it's not as simple as say our water quality report card uh, because, you know, you could look retrospectively, you could look prospectively to see what that trajectory is in addition to current trends. And as, as Maya was saying, there's also some nuance in how we're reporting the projects and how that translates to the colors. Um, but, you know, I, I think just moving forward, if we can get to a place where we can report 
more readily each year of where we're at, what the, what the trends have been in the past and how we can look moving forward. That will be an improvement on top of the existing reporting products we do have for the HPU. And so, um, you know, we, we've got a lot of good feedback on this call today. And I think if there's any other brilliant ideas moving forward, please definitely let us know. And we could try to uh, incorporate that in this, uh, what this product looks like in the future. And I'll just add that I think it's really important um, for folks to help us understand how you use the Habitat Master Plan because I, I hear some people tossing around ideas that are like pretty idealistic in terms of like how uh, a land acquisition um, staff person might use the Habitat Master Plan and you know how important is it that we distinguish between red and black mangroves and like how how will we use this information like there are there are certain applications that are important that we understand you know how these different um spe down to different species are are reacting and responding to the pressures of climate change and land land development but then there's also like the utility of the habitat master plan and what would actually be useful to the people that are you know actually restoring restoring lands or acquiring lands and so making sure that we're responsive not just to the science questions but also to the you know the management and restoration applications i think is important um is important to consider too and so if you have thoughts about that please let marcus and mike know Brandon had one comment before we move on to the next topic. Brandon, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, no, I think it, it gets to what we were just talking about, you know, the nuances of those colors. Um, you know, I think the it's just dealing with the primary threats of essentially climate change and development are, I think, the two leaders of the pack um and uh i mean it's it, it's like i said it, it's the complicated behind the scenes of those colors but how the how they are presented and reflected i mean you've got interactions and overlap where some habitats may be uh you know the primary threat may be development versus climate change, but then put that on top and we are still developing in areas that will certainly be affected by climate change. So it's, uh, you may have competing threats there, but um, yeah, I don't think there's too much to go into. I think you guys covered it. It's just um, figuring out the nuances of what those colors what are behind those colors as marcus said so i'm sure that will get worked out as as we work through this for sure all right thanks everyone yeah just to add to that thought and then i put it in the, the chat i think you know the important consideration in my mind is the, the potential for diminishing opportunities for each of those habitats so it's really the trajectory of where opportunities for restoration might exist in the future is maybe an important metric we should be tracking because that link I provided in the chat to the, to the target and goal table, it's, you know, we pretty much are certain that that total restoration opportunity column is going to get smaller and smaller with each successive land use land cover update. So once we reach a threshold where there's not enough opportunity to meet a 2030 or 2050 target, that's our target and goal that's when you know that the plan becomes unrealistic or untenable at that point and we need to come up with alternative solutions to if we really want to get that those extent of those habitats we need to find novel ways to um, provide for restoration opportunities that might not exist in the future and that's that's kind of what i was thinking of when i was framing that question of you know like you said, opportunity loss, you know, but if you can define the threat a little bit more or, or identify it, you can maybe more aggressively pursue, you know, if, if a certain habitat, you know, marsh, uh, you know, saltwater marsh or even salt barren or something like that is we're losing more to development than we are to 
climate change, then maybe you can, the goals can shift more towards more aggressive land uh, acquisition, you know, to, to preserve that opportunity. Um, but anyway, I, I think that's all I need to say on it. Okay. Uh, thank you for that great discussion, everyone. Um, our next topic is going to be uh, Marcus talking about some of the long-term macroalgae trends. Um, as you might remember at our last TAC meeting, we talked um, about some of the observations of a large ulva bloom in Hillsborough Bay. And then in the wake of Piney Point, we've all been noticing uh, macroalgae in the bay, whether it's um, Dapis blooms in Anna Maria or Lower Boca Ciega Bay, um, or you know just the whole mix of things. So we thought we would take uh, a look and see what we know, what we don't know, and Marcus is gonna share what he found out. You can see my slides in full presenter mode, right? I sure can. Excellent, all right, well, um, I really appreciate that last discussion about the HMPU. It's all it's all good, relevant stuff. Um, I'm going to switch gears now to to macroalgae, as as Maya stated. Um, you know, we I think in the last year or so have had a lot of questions about the importance of macroalgae, um, given you know Piney Point and some of the shifts we've seen in our seagrass surveys. Um, but I think you know before we really can nail down what is the value of macroalgae, we need to do kind of a retrospective analysis of, of just how it looks normally in the Bay. Uh, and I titled this talk, uh, you know, what we don't know, because I think this is really just an exercise in diminishing returns with, with the data that we have and kind of exposing the limitations of, of current data sets that, that were, um, that, that I'll talk about. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to go through kind of a brief exercise of, of looking at the existing data sets to explore what is the information we can get about macroalgae to really kind of um, inform some of these current questions we have, but also maybe uh, set a path forward for a discussion about how we can maybe develop or amend existing monitoring programs to sort of fill some of these, these knowledge gaps about macroalgae as it currently stands in the system. So. Um, Right, so I don't want to, you know, spend too much time on on macroalgae in terms of why we care about it. We all know it's it's an important component of primary productivity, uh, and not just Tampa Bay, but other coastal systems. Um, as Maya mentioned, you know, there's there's been changes that have recently occurred in, in Tampa Bay and, and other places. You know, replacing uh, seagrasses in certain parts of the bay, uh, and you know, we we know that it's you know having macroalgae is is probably better than, than no habitat at all, but what is the trade-off between seagrass versus macroalgae and how do we sort of quantify those and, and in turn maybe think about, you know, what is what is the trade-off and what does that mean for uh, different management strategies in terms of, of um, uh, protecting the different resources as they currently stand. So, so that's kind of the basis for this, but more specifically, um, you know, in certain parts of the Bay, we have seen some pretty dramatic shifts in the last couple of years from seagrasses to, to macroalgae. In this case, Calerpa is one, one point of concern here. Uh, this is a, a graphic from our seagrass transect dashboard that you can link on the bottom right there, uh, looking at the, the long-term trend at the Feather Sound transect um, from about 2012 to uh, last year showing basically this this dramatic replacement of of, of uh Halliduli with with Calerpa. and you know what does that mean <laughs> you know what is the value obviously losing seagrass is not something we want but is replacing with Calerpa um just as good in terms of you know benefit for you know stabilizing the sediment or providing habitat for other you know epifaunal communities that sort of stuff um, and actually i think i heard recently from chris that um this year, uh, now the Calerpa has basically kind of all uh, gone away. And so is, you know, what is this, this phenology, this boom bust cycle of Calerpa, what does that mean for nutrient cycling in terms of water quality or just habitat benefits in general? So this is a concern, a lot of questions. We are seeing these shifts, what does it mean? Um, the other, I think, motivating factor for this analysis was, was Piney Point. Um, you know, there were a lot of anecdotal concerns and also just the results of our data sets showing that there is a, a 
a shift in the macroalgae community uh, following the releases from Piney Point in uh, March and April of last year. And so um, this is a figure from the paper we just published that sort of summarized the six months of results for uh, the sampling that occurred post Piney Point. And what we saw basically was that there were some, some differences, notable changes in the macroalgae community following Piney Point uh, that were of note. Um, similarly, we didn't see um, a lot of changes in the seagrass community. But, um, you know, this was basically say this is what we saw, but we didn't really have a lot of historical context to really say that uh, these changes were out of the ordinary uh, in terms of what the normal long term or seasonal uh, uh, changes in macroalgae or seagrasses are in the bay. So, um, this really, you know, this this analysis kind of highlighted the need for uh, this retrospective analysis, but also maybe starting a discussion for how do we how do we collect data differently in the future to better understand, um, you know, these changes, uh, you know, if they're abnormal or not. So this is just a statement uh, from the paper that sort of draw that drew that point out to to make a case for, um, you know, maybe uh, thinking about monitoring differently in the future. Um, so what do we what data do we have available to, to look at this analysis or, or look at these changes in the historical context? And the two I want to highlight are uh, the interagency seagrass monitoring uh, that that I think we're all familiar with. Um, you know, this is a multi-agency effort every year. Uh, we go out and collect seagrass data. Um, you know, there's a long record there, 20 years of sampling. Um, it's done typically in the fall, um, about, about 60 plus transects, and it's a great resource for tracking seagrass trends. Um, Macroalgae communities, drift and attached algae uh, are supposed to be collected as part of that effort. Um, you know, and it varies in terms of you know who's collecting the information, whether or not they identify it as species, and and um, you know it's just it's a source of information that we can look at to see is it valuable for understanding the the past trends in this community. So that's kind of the first thing I did, and as a first cut, I, I sort of I took all of the records we had for the the transect monitoring to to get a sense of um, the number of records we had for seagrass versus non-SAV or, or macroalgae, whether that's drift or attached. And so you can look at, you know, this is about 22, 23 years of, of data uh, that we've had for the interagency seagrass monitoring. And you can see that obviously most of the records are seagrasses because that's what we're targeting. But I was just trying to get a sense of, of the other things that you could collect or could could note down in the sampling. Um, how often does that show up in the record? And so, you know, comparatively to seagrasses, the macroalgae, not so much, uh, but some things like Calerpa are actually, there are quite a few records there. Um, so I took this and said, well, you know, I know that there's a lot of limitations in looking at macroalgae with this data set, but again, I just took the macroalgae data, the Calerpa data, and I just summarized it by major base segments to see, is there a long-term trend that is is noticeable again knowing the limitations of of these types of data in that 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 data set so um this shows a breakdown of percent frequency occurrence of of calerpa uh one because that was something that i thought was popping up a lot more than just the regular macroalgae categories that i kind of lumped into this generic group for this analysis um, but you can see that um, you know, it is kind of noisy information, and, and again, take it with a grain of salt, but um, it does look like there are maybe some long-term trends, you know, maybe increasing Calerpa macroalgae in Old Tampa Bay in the last five, six years or so, um, maybe in some of the other base segments, but, um, you know, again, this is seeing what, what we can see with, with, with the data that we have. Um, and really, with, with this data set, this is kind of where I stopped, and I, you know, I don't think we can take this any further in terms of extracting a macroalgae signal, primarily because these data are taken only in the fall. So really, all we can look at, I think, is long-term trends across two decades or so. Um, and then this kind of brought me to the next analysis, where I'm looking at a different data set that does have uh, not just that long-term record. Um, like like the uh, interagency seagrass monitoring, but they do go out every month within each year, so we can 
you can look at a seasonal signal in addition to the long-term record. So I'm looking at now the FWC FIM data, so the fisheries independent monitoring data. Um, again, a great data source targeting fish, obviously, but what's cool about this data set is they, they, they track bycatch. And so drift algae is, it can be a potentially important part of that bycatch. And I wanted to, to extract that information from this database to, to again, look at not just long-term trends, but can we look at a, a seasonal signal as well to put, you know, maybe some of the stuff like Piney Point into better context. Um, so I took that data set and before I kind of explain the results here, I just want to highlight this, this paper that was published earlier this year uh, by some folks from the St. John's River uh, Water Management District and others uh, looking at uh, basically long-term trends in macroalgae in the Indian River Lagoon. And so they actually kind of did the same thing that I'm, I'm, I'm about to show you. They, they, they took the FIM bycatch data uh, to extract the, uh, that, that, that data to look at the trends in IRL uh, and compare it to some, some actual, you know, transect monitoring data they had, some, some hydroacoustic data they have, um, and, uh, you know, kind of understood the, the dynamics there. And, you know, as a precautionary message here, this paper was, was actually, you know, looking at maybe what is the role of macroalgae for nutrient cycling in the system and how does that sort of cascade to changes in the seagrasses so obviously IRL has had a, a basically a collapse of, of, of the ecosystem and, and a huge loss of seagrasses and this paper was kind of looking at you know was macroalgae an important component there because they do see you know in some years you know there's this boom bust cycle of macroalgae and then it tends to go away and 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 you know maybe a year or two later uh, with the changes and the release of nutrients from that, you know, the, the, the decay of macroalgae, what does that mean for uh, changes in the phytoplankton community, changes in the light habitats, and ultimately maybe a, a, a negative effect on the seagrasses? So this was kind of their question they're looking at, um, you know, uh, but in Tampa Bay, it's a little more, uh, the story's a little bit different. I, obviously, we're not quite there in terms of seagrass losses like IRL, but, you um, you know, we, we have similar questions. What is the role of macroalgae for habitat, um, nutrient cycling, all of these things? And so I encourage you all to have a look at this paper uh, to, to sort of see what their conclusions were. But from my perspective, I was just looking at this paper from, from the analysis side to see if we could kind of follow their, their steps to, to evaluating the FIM data. So again, what I did with the bycatch data, um, thanks to, to Megan Schrant from FWC for getting me this, this data set, but I was using it to look at, again, not just the long-term trend, but because they go out every month um, within that 20-year period, could I describe the seasonal signal of the macroalgae as well? Uh, and I was looking at um, you know, uh, variation in different parts of the bay as well to see if you know, there was a difference between, say, Old Tampa Bay versus Lower Tampa Bay, given that you know, there is that, that nice uh, spatial gradient. Um, and I was, you know, the, the plots I'll show you as well uh, is broken down by different gear types. So I was looking at the 21.3 meter uh, shoreline seine and then also the 183 meter hull seine. And these are the same gear types that were evaluated in the paper that I just mentioned. Um, so I showed you a graph similar to this um, uh, for the, the transect monitoring data. But this is showing you a breakdown of SAV versus non-SAV, so macroalgae for the FIM bycatch data. And what you'll see is actually kind of a flip in terms of the number of records that apply to each type, uh, because I think this the the hull sains are actually you know able to target the drift macroalgae a lot better than than you know um, you know the transect monitoring database. So I think this is actually a pretty good uh, resource for capturing drift macroalgae as a whole, um, but uh, definitely not to the genus or species level because, you know, it's bycatch, it's not their primary focus. Uh, and so for this analysis, I, I just, again, lumped everything that I could consider macroalgae into just a, a macroalgae generic group to look at these long-term trends. Uh, and so this is, uh, again, a similar plot looking at spatial trends as well as the long-term 
uh, trend over the last 20 years, uh, kind of aggregating all of the bycatch data from the FIM database into median catch per unit effort for the different gear types. And so um, green is the 21.3 meter haul, gray is the 183 meter uh, sane. Uh, and it's noisy, <laughs> you know, just like uh, the transect data. Uh, but if you squint, you can kind of see some trends there, maybe some increases uh, in recent years in certain base segments. Uh, and again, this is just sort of distilling all of the information to see if I could identify broad patterns. Um, but what's new here is, again, looking at the seasonal trends. We're able to do that because, again, they go out every month getting the macroalgae data. And this is kind of the same you know, uh, source of data here, but but averaging the results within each month across the 20 years of data, uh, broken down by gear type and different bait types. And what's cool here is you actually, I think, do see a seasonal trend. Um, you know, there appears to be what looks like a spring peak for macroalgae, um, kind of a, a, a decline in late summer and fall as it sort of senesces, which I think is a normal cycle. And then also potentially in some parts of the bay, maybe even a, a fall peak as different species sort of um, show up uh, based on the natural progression of, of macroalgae. So, so this was me to me, I think, a, a good way to, to sort of describe that normal seasonal pattern. But again, it is quite noisy because it's a lot of spatial variation. The data aren't necessarily um, uh, collected consistently uh, by different crews because uh, they're not targeting macroalgae. Uh, but I thought what I could do is, is, and this is where it gets a little nerdy, uh, do some some more high-level time series modeling to, because these data are, are quite noisy, use some models to extract a signal of what is that long-term or seasonal trend from this, this noisy data set. And so I used um, generalized additive models uh, because it's something I've used in the past, I'm familiar with it, but... Um, I think it's something that is well suited for this purpose of extracting a seasonal or long-term trend from a noisy data set. So uh, if you're not familiar with GAMS, it's like basically any regression model where you're fitting a response as a function of different independent predictors. Um, in this case, we're using time as the predictor, so no other explanatory variables here, just trying to explain the trend. Uh, but where GAMs depart from regular GLMs or linear models is instead of um, looking at a response as a function of a linear effect, you're, you're fitting uh, multi-polynomial smoothing splines to capture a nonlinear trend. And these splines are additive, and each spline can describe a different part of the trend. And so I've, I've tried to break it down here in terms of what I'm modeling. So I'm looking at the response, so CPU, the long-term time series, and the different base segments as a function of uh, the long-term trend. So what is that multi-decadal signal? But I'm also modeling a spline as a function of day of year to look at a seasonal trend and also the interaction of the two to look at maybe how that seasonal sing that seasonal signal varies between years because it might not be stationary. And then, of course, an unexplained component, which, as you'll see, is, is actually a pretty large <laughs> part of these models. So um, that's all that is, a nonlinear uh, response-based uh, uh, regression for the most part. So that's what, you know, I fit these models to the different gear types, the CPUE as, as the response, and did it by different base segments as, be, as before. And so these models show the results. Each point is an actual observation of the bycatch CPUE, uh, and the green line is the predicted response from the models. And so this is, a, this is on a log scale, so some of these smaller values look a bit stretched out. But what we, we can see from this is that you know there is what looks like a model long-term trend. And depending on what base segment you're looking at and what gear type you're looking at, there is a seasonal trend in there as well that the model picks up. Um, but before I go any further, uh, just want to point out, you know, these model fits are not great. Um, this just shows a breakdown of, of kind of standard summary statistics for these types of models. Um, R squared, you know, that's a pretty common one. It is pretty low for a lot of these. So I wouldn't necessarily use these, these models for much more than really kind of um, just describing um, 
these things in a little more detail than just the observational data. Um, so uh, I, I think there's still value in, in the models just because the fit isn't great. Uh, but I just wanted to point this out that that is it's um, you know I think we can do better. But for the purpose of pulling out a signal, uh, I think they can be quite useful. So what is that signal? Um, this is a alternative way to look at these model predictions. I just showed you the plot of the observed values and the predicted time series. This is kind of the same thing, but taking that predicted time series and layering each year on top of each other and putting on the x-axis the day of the year. And so again, top row is tw uh, one gear type, the bottom row is the second gear type, and then the columns are, are the different base segments. And what's cool about these plots is you can see how the the estimated signal of the CPUE for macroalgae has changed between the years. So like old Tampa Bay looks like it's quite high early in the time series. It, it decreases uh, around about 2005, 2010, and then in the last five years looks like it kind of increased again. Um, so you can look at the long-term trend, but you can also see the seasonal signal as well. So um, most of these, these um, uh, predictions show a strong spring seasonal peak, but depending on where you look, you can also see a, a fall peak like old Tampa Bay, for example. So again, just sort of highlighting how these models can kind of extract that signal based on how we construct fits. Um, and just sort of taking that one step further, um, these models, because they are additive, you know, these this is sort of showing the total prediction. We can actually isolate the estimated um, effects of the different additive components to get a more clear picture of what what is the long-term trend or what is the seasonal trend. And so I'm going to show you this, this annual trend. So this is just the additive spline for the long-term effect of, of um, year, essentially. And so we can use this spline to, to sort of say, how has macroalgae CPUE changed in the long run? And so it's noisy depending on where you look and what gear type, but I think in some cases, just as I showed with the observed data, you do see what looks like maybe an increase in CPUE uh, in certain base segments. So Hillsborough Bay, for example, looks like it has increased um, in the last five years or so, and maybe same for lower Tampa Bay. Um, so again, just sort of pulling out the model components to understand what is that long-term trend. Um, we could do the same thing with the seasonal trend. So here's pulling out the smoothing spline for season. And this just more clearly describes, you know, what is the estimated seasonal effect or seasonal phenology of, of macroalgae in the different base segments. So obviously a strong spring signal. Uh, and then in some cases looks like maybe a false signal, uh, depending on where you look uh, in the bay. Um, and then finally, you know, it's one thing to kind of describe the long-term trend, describe the seasonal trend, but maybe we want to say with some level of certainty, is that trend significant within the constraints of the model we've used? Again, it's not a great model because the fits are, you know, the explained variance is quite low, but we might want to say with some level of certainty, you know, in the last five or 10 years, has CPUE, has CPUE actually increased in certain base segments? And so, um, you know, take these results with a grain of salt, but um, what, what this shows basically is within each year, what is the model average CPUE with a confidence interval around it? And then taking those model averages and fitting a linear trend to those to see if the increase or decrease is significant. And so I've shown, from these results, uh, uh, different base segments and gear types where that increase is significant. So Old Tampa Bay, Hillsborough Bay, Lower Tampa Bay, um, not really Middle Tampa Bay, and it does vary by gear type, but um, just sort of really squeezing the data for all it's worth to see if we can really get get a some level of confidence and if these changes are are significant or not and and are they you know uh, what are the implications of those from a management perspective and and actually if you have interest that the methods for how this is done is is described in this paper so um, 
Yeah, uh, again, like I said, this is kind of an exercise in, in diminishing returns to see what we don't know from these different data sets. But I think that, you know, there there is value in looking at that so we can sort of pave the way forward for filling these knowledge gaps. Um, you know, we do see long term trends. We do see seasonal trends that that are maybe uh, anecdotal or, you know, you, you kind of, you know, we heard a lot about, you know, what 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 was the normal change, you know, um, after Piney Point, uh, you know, what was abnormal, but with these data sets, we're really trying to sort of quantitatively describe these normal trends. And so it's not surprising we saw a spring bloom. Um, you know, it's not really surprising we saw a fall bloom in some locations, but I think now with these tools, we can sort of with more confidence describe them and then again, sort of expose knowledge gaps uh, moving forward so that we can better characterize these results moving forward. So um, with both the, yeah, the, the transect data and the FIM bycatch data, um, I think the two biggest uh, drawbacks are there isn't species level information. And, and in some cases there is, but there's not a consistent recording of that information over time to be able to say that, oh, ulva is increasing more than say grassalaria or that sort of thing. So I think maybe we need to do a better job um, estimating species level uh, abundances. In addition to creating that, I guess, long-term record of the seasonal uh, phenology uh, that that is somewhat captured in the FIM bycatch data, but obviously not in the transect data because we go out every year. Um, so now I'm kind of opening up the door for, I guess, a discussion about how do we enhance monitoring to fill these knowledge gaps. And I know that these conversations are always kind of difficult because uh, no one ever wants to do more because <laughs> there's always a lot of effort uh, uh, that is, is in place to uh, do these existing monitoring data sets. So I'm not saying that we need to do more, but I just want to open the door for, for a discussion about um, how do we fill these gaps in a way that doesn't strain existing resources? So um, I think, you know, the gap is greater seasonal resolution. How do we fill that? Uh, maybe how do we better um, ID macroalgae? Um, Sheila has done a great job, you know, creating a, a nice sort of guide for identifying macroalgae that we could use. Um, weight data is important, uh, not just bulk weight estimates, but by species. So we can get a biomass estimate by species as a more quantitative uh, estimate there. And then, you know, we've been talking internally um, about maybe what is the potential for citizen science pilot projects to, to sort of see uh, that as a, a pool uh, for uh, filling some of these gaps as well. And so we're, we're kind of scoping that out to see what is the potential there? Is it scalable? Is it reliable? And how does that dovetail with some of these existing monitoring efforts to, to supplement those? So, um, I appreciate the time today to sort of, um, you know, do this brain dump of, of what are these trends with, with macroalgae and I invite a discussion about um, not just the analysis I did, but how do we move forward to, to fill this gap with, with macroalgae. So uh, thank you. Dave. Yeah. Hey, uh, Marcus, great job. And, and, you know, for everyone who's collected you know this kind of data and i would say i saw in the chat comments a uh, reference to roger rogers and uh uh and also walt avery had a great data set that showed uh, a substantial reduction of macroalgae in uh hillsborough bay uh concurrent everyone knows about the phytoplankton story but the macroalgae reduction was just dramatic as equally as dramatic if not more so um we have found uh, the macroalgae were a better indicator of the problems in Sarasota Bay than anything in the water column. And, and so uh, a lot of respect to uh, Sheila Scalaro, uh, who you stole from Sarasota, uh, to actually putting together a great monitoring program. We've modified that. Uh, our Eyes on Seagrass is now uh, an EPA approved QAP, uh, which is using uh, the technique that Betty Stogler uh, has initiated for a couple of years. And the value that we found not simply doing percent cover, but uh, weight that Mark has talked about, is that we've also contracted with Moat to actually do nutrient content. And the reason why we found this to be important is there's parts of our bay where if we extrapolate from the weight data that we've got, uh, there's more nitrogen in the macroalgae than there is in the water column. And, and so if you look at some of the places 
where uh, nutrient loading uh, ecosystem response models don't really calibrate that well. It could be that like because the nutrients are going into the macroalgae rather than floating around triggering phytoplankton. So I'd say if you do an approach, there are you know techniques that have been established you know for Charlotte Harbor, Lemon Bay. We've been doing like Jay is talking about. Jay is the coordinator for our work in Sarasota Bay. Um, but you know the value of doing this approach is you not only do percent coverage, but one out of every six stations you do a wet weight of macroalgae. You know, you can send that off and get lab analysis, and then you can figure out how much of the nitrogen is in macroalgae, how much is in the water column. I doubt it's going to be the same phenomena in the lower bay of, of Tampa Bay than like Little Sarasota Bay. But for example, in Little Sarasota Bay, there is much more nitrogen in macroalgae than there is in phytoplankton. And so uh, I don't know how you guys are going to move forward, but you're, you're not the first people to do it. Learn from what other folks have done. And if it's helpful, incorporate it. But uh, we're doing it. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, with all the piney point sampling that was done, that was the methodology that we used. And it was really cool to be able to say, you know, this is the estimated biomass of, of green algae or red algae. But, you know, what good is that information if there is no basis of comparison to see if it was abnormal or not? And then I think that's kind of the, the motivation for these discussions now is how do we do better in the future so that, you know, if we do have other events, hopefully not, uh, like Piney Point moving forward, we can really say that, you know, this is not a normal response and something needs to be done about it, so. I, I think that is, that's that's one of the really important things, but it also like, for example, you know, uh, there's been loads of literature going back to the, the, the 70s and 80s about the role of macroalgae in the inner river lagoon. And uh, it's not like macroalgae is a new phenomenon, but you know, uh, it could be that we have like missed out on monitoring one of the uh, major uh, indications of, of eutrophication by so focusing on water quality because it's work, but maybe things are shifting, you know, but, you know, Hillsborough Bay's macroalgae decline, which Roger ch chime in here, was so substantial. It's something really important. And, and it was the better indicator of eutrophication in Sarasota Bay than the water column. Roger, are you online? I just posted a link to his prior basis talks um, using that Hillsborough Bay data. I think it was in 2003 was the last basis presentation he did. But uh, I know, you know, just through chatting with him, he says uh, a lot of that information through 2010 has been archived in the USS Special Collection. So it'd be good to maybe dig out that information and look at. Um, that in comparison to uh, more contemporary records to see how it compares. So, Roger, feel free to jump in if you had any. I, I linked in the chat to your basis three presentation. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to hear though, like if anybody has ideas about how monitoring could be done better. Um, you know, I. I as, as someone who's, I guess, the beneficiary of, of long-term monitoring data sets, it's easy for me to propose uh, what could be done better um, without really understanding the limitations. Uh, but I also, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to to change or suggest changes to existing monitoring programs that, that potentially can affect the ability to retroactively compare to past data sets. So, I mean, it's those limitations I, I try to keep in mind, but I mean, is it feasible to ask FEM crews to identify all species of macroalgae? Probably not. Um, you know, what about our interagency seagrass monitoring? I mean, is it feasible to ask people to record all species of macroalgae in addition to seagrasses? Maybe, I don't know. Um, and if so, like, how do we how do we address those limitations or what is the feasibility of of citizens to potentially support this um you know i don't have a good sense of that and maybe sheila can can talk about her experience working with citizen sciences or citizen scientists and, and, and if they could be a viable resource to to support this yeah um i think that 
incorporating communities like uh, like community members like Sarasota Bay and Charlotte Harbor have done. Um, I think that's definitely a viable way to um, to kind of help to fill some of these data gaps. But I do think that there are some limitations. I I think that a lot of um, folks that are on the water all the time, like captains and, and fishermen, I think they have, um, and just bay users in general, I think they would have the capacity to kind of um, determine and identify some of the kind of like higher level groups of macroalgae, like your Gracilaria, your Acanthophora, Calerpa, Ulva, things like that. But when you're starting to get into like the nitty gritty of like some of the some of the reds that look very similar to other reds. Um, I think that that might be a little bit more challenging, but um, it kind of goes back to like, is that what we're looking for? Um, can we just have them collect, a, collect a, a biomass data and then work with our partners at um, FWC or Mode or wherever um, to kind of identify those species from like a, a subsample? Um, so I don't I don't really know kind of the the best way to to approach it, but I do think it's important um, to to leverage the community members, um, particularly the bay users that are on the water all the time, like the the fishermen and the guides and and those groups. Um, the Tampa Bay Waterkeepers are developing a uh, a patrol program. So the idea is to engage bay users primarily these fishermen and guides um, to kind of be the eyes on the water. So it's sort of a, a pollution reporting tool is, is the uh, primary focus of this program. Um, and so I think of it similar to like FWC's Fish Kill Hotline um, to where um, it, it could be good uh, to kind of help us internally identify like where where are the blooms occurring things like that but i also think that it can be biased based on like heavily used locations in the bay um, and might not really help with some of those um those seasonal trends and seasonal components that we're trying to understand um so but i do think that it's important maybe we can work with captains to kind of most of them have have their spots that they go to so maybe we can say hey can you report on 10 different sites or something like that and just give us an estimate of coverage or, or something. So so, so I don't really know the best way forward. So I'm, I'd love to hear more conversations from some of the other folks in the room um, of what, what they think. I had a question. This is Stacy with Pinellas County. Um, you know, we're out doing monitoring eight times a year, random sites which I'll be talking about soon, um, you know, we do make note of any drift algae and species that we see, but, you know, we're not doing any sort of um, quantitative, you know, just more of just this was here, you know, so no uh, measurement of coverage. It's just, you know, at our site, was it there? Was it not? Did we see it? Would that be helpful information or not so much? Any any data is good data. Uh, <laughs> no, it's just well that comes with a lot of assumptions too. But um, I mean, yeah, part of part of this effort is finding out who has this information. Um, you know, the FIM bycatch was was the first one we thought because uh, we know that they've been collecting for a long time. But um, other sources of information to help support or confirm what we've already got from from this analysis it's fantastic. Um, you know. Uh, but yeah, moving forward, I mean, there's there's a lot of questions about, um, you know, is is it valuable to keep collecting that information, or if so, how can it be collected better without, you know, putting too much strain on on existing resources? And and I, I just want to go back to what Sheila was talking about too. I mean, any any proposed citizen science project, you know, we're I think it's the first question is not going to be can they collect all of the data for us to answer these questions. It's gonna be like, what are they comfortable with collecting and is it reliable? Um, you know, because yeah, it, it's just, it's a pilot project. And I think, um, you know, we're still in the early phases of just describing uh, what type of information we want, uh, but it will just explore the feasibility and not necessarily give us all the answers after you know the first year or two so we're open to ideas definitely 
Hey, Marcus, this is Brandon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I kind of put the same uh, grain of salt uh, on some of the prior data, and, and you certainly put plenty of caveats on your description. But, you know, even the FIM data, you got to look at what the priority was when that data was collected. And, you know, by, by nature of it being a bycatch, that obviously puts it as a secondary priority and even more so it's um, having sifted through some of that in the in those fim nets it's sometimes with the you know the squeaky wheel gets the grease and so the interaction and the um, how much attention was paid to that bycatch is likely a factor of how much it affected the process of counting the fish and sorting the sample in and of itself. So I, I think you're certainly aware of those limitations on that data and, you know, the context that it was collected. But, um, you know, as Dave said, if it's something that's uh, more apparently uh, important, if the importance of that data is uh, we're coming to realize that then the priority of collecting more complete data uh, on these species seems to be worth it. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, that's, that, that's a good point, Brandon. I, I, um, I, I think that's right. I, I did kind of a similar analysis for Sarasota Bay a couple of years ago, but not as sophisticated with respect to the modeling, but I used presence absence data getting back to what Stacy um, was asking um, for some of those reasons. Um, and I actually looked at, at both a little bit, but I went with the presence absence data and found, you know, pretty similar results with respect to seasonality. And, and I just think I don't want to overlook the importance of just that finding. I think, um, you know, the fact that we found it in both estuaries is important. And I think we need to think about, you know, why that is, um, you know, why is, you know, what is causing the seasonality in uh, this drift algae abundance? And I guess a question to you guys again is, um, you know, if there are drift algae that are attached for certain parts of the year and then break off and drift, uh, you know, are those potential study sites, you know, that we could use to try and hone in on the seasonality component? Because I think it's really interesting that, you know, it, it does seem to be winter or, you know, spring as opposed to summer is when these um, macroalgae seem to proliferate. So I'll just throw that out there. Uh, I wanted to build on something that Chris put in the notes, which is like, you know, the, there's gonna be multiple users, multiple mu multiple value to what you're, you're proposing to do. But like, you know, for example, when we quantify, you know, the phytoplankton response to Tampa Bay, we do know species, right? But a lot of the management paradigm is nitrogen load versus chlorophyll as a surrogate. Uh, if you use total nitrogen, you, we don't, you know, thrash ourselves trying to figure out, well, is it in diatoms or is it in, you know, I mean, for the most part, we, we already take into account that species is less important than uh, understanding where the nitrogen goes to. And so I would suggest it's important for us to like, you know, understand what types of macroalgae, but if the nutrient content of DAPIS is kind of similar to what it is for, you know, Acanthophora or others or within a realm of reasonable, then it may not matter so much what the species is as just the biomass. And I'm not saying that you don't try to break it out, but don't let that stop you from collecting data. And uh, this is one of those weird things, but, you know, it's sort of like when you see what a lot of macroalgae looks like, then you understand why it is important to actually quantify it. And Sheila had some beautiful pictures of really gross conditions in Lemon Bay, for example, where there was just, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was ketomorpha, anamorpha, whatever, but it was massive amounts of macroalgae. And not having a number on the biomass meant that we didn't know, you know, whether or not it was a more important destination. So I think there's lots of things to do, but to me, one of the most important things to do is get some weight data, get some nutrient data, and figure out if you've got maybe 10 times as much nitrogen tied up in macroalgae than in the water column. And, and that is potentially important because if your management paradigm is focused on the water column and chlorophyll and water clarity alone, 
That works in a lot of places and it's been working for decades, but it doesn't work in parts of our system and it's not working in Lemon Bay. So I think that's a, an important thing to kind of look at. I think it's more important to know the biomass than to know the species composition that makes up that biomass. Can I, uh, can I follow up on Dave's comments, uh, everybody? And with, especially with respect to the volunteer component of this, uh, because uh, Sheila's right and you all are right, it's very challenging to be able to identify algal species in the field, especially a volunteer. And um, so it, it's the species uh, composition with respect to nutrients, I don't think is as important as, as Dave said, the biomass, getting, getting a number on just how much nitrogen could be tied up. And I'm also thinking, you know, with our seagrass programs, you know, most of the time we're just looking at seagrass. We really don't uh, partition out things according to species there as well. So I don't think we're really losing any valuable data by, by lumping things into just macroalgae. The, the volunteer program has really been successful. This is our second year and it certainly gets easier, you know, once you get a program up and running. Uh, we have lots of volunteers. We're covering 45 sites in a, within a two-week period, twice a year now. So we're going to be generating lots of useful data. And they do take uh, small scales out with them. So we can get weights, you know, we get wet weight from those, uh, from those samples. And so it's extremely valuable data. And I don't think we're losing much information by trying to have them uh, identify and break things out by species. Just to lump onto the, the conversation, thanks Dave and Jay. I, I, you know, when we were thinking about this internally, you know, the question in my mind is not that there's macroalgae in Tampa Bay. It's whether or not the macroalgae are presenting themselves as in a dystrophic fashion, and biomass is probably one of the key indicators for that. And if we're not collecting any information on on macroalgae biomass, that's a significant gap in our monitoring efforts. Hey guys, I just I, I wanted to just point out something Natasha um, had in the chat, which I think is a, a good potentially a good idea that you know the ramp program is probably a good venue to really start hashing out specifics on what kind of data to collect. Um, so that might be something that that we could bring up. The other place too that I think this is going to be a really good discussion is going to be at the the next um, Seagrass Working Group meeting. I, I don't think we have one on the books planned yet, but uh, I would like to continue this discussion in a more technical fashion and kind of really get into the weeds on what we're trying to answer. So the questions are really important. What do we want to know? And each of us, I think, on this call um, are uniquely suited to, to help answer certain questions. Um, for example, we map seagrass. We use aerial imagery. There's a lot of information in that imagery that we're just now starting to, to look at ways to pull out with respect to looking at successional changes in certain areas of, of the coast. Um, we can see macroalgae coming in. We can differentiate between the drift algae and the seagrass in terms of aerial right. signature. Well, that, so how do we use that as a tool to help inform many of us on this call on you know what do we do about it or is there anything we could do about it? So maybe a ramp would be a good place to to kind of talk a little bit more about and think through some of these more specific elements of what what we really want to be out there collecting. We, I tell you what, we went through, you know, we've been mapping seagrass since 1988. And from the early days when Tom Reese was doing it and Dave after him, and, and all the way to today, we have evolved our field data collection as, as technology has advanced. Um, I think we've become a very efficient we become very efficient at collecting just the right data that we need to make a better product. And of course that involves using things like survey one, two, three, GoPros. Now we're starting to use ROVs. Um, but the idea is what's the minimal amount of information I can get in order to answer the questions that were, that are being asked. Um, it'd be great to go out and collect everything. And, and there is a place for that. And I think those that are in academic inst institutions absolutely should do that. But for the more resource management focus groups, we need to know what is that minimum. Biomass, I'm hearing, is really important. Percent cover, also important. Species, maybe not as important, 
but good to have. So anyway, maybe maybe we have a group, uh, maybe through Ramp, maybe through the Seagrass Working Group, to kind of flesh this out a little bit more. Because I don't think we're going to have the answer today. We'll, we'll be here, you know, till till Friday. So anyway, I just want to throw that out to the group to see um, what y'all thought. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're out, we're actually uh, meeting with FWC this afternoon about a phytoplankton PAB uh, opportunity in that regard. So um, I'll keep you guys posted. But one of my questions is, is I'm seeing a lot of um, information and comments popping up about volunteer programs that are already doing this. I'm kind of curious about, because I know we've, we've, discuss this within our group and with Piney Point, there was a lot of coordination where people were jumping in and can we come out on the boat with you and collect this or that? Um, do some of the main, you know, county, state, regional uh, monitoring entities have the ability to maybe partner with some of these volunteer agencies and have a person come out with monitoring staff? I know Pinellas County probably could, but that might be an option versus like, hey, let's ask our monitoring <laughs> staff to collect more data. Um, I just don't know if that is something that we could maybe consider um, as an effort to get some of this data as well. Uh, you know, just as an FYI, we don't restrict ourselves to just, you know, um, paid scientists. We actually have folks who are scientists to do it. We actually have volunteers who are members of our citizen advisory committee. So we have it standardized that uh, it's, it's hard to not collect it, uh, the data that you need, but we're not restricting ourselves just to paid, you know, biologists going and collecting this data. And that's, and that's really helpful, Dave. I, I will, I will second that because you know, one of the things that that has made our maps, our seagrass maps, a better product is exactly that. You know, we talk to fishermen, we talk to the locals, and and a lot of it is thanks to folks like you, Dave, and and Ed, and Maya, and and the folks down in Charlotte Harbor, Mindy, Dave Blewett. I mean, we have. Yeah, I think there's a, a bunch of us on the call here. We kind of have a thing called the the uh, Macroalgae Friends Network, and and we literally like get emails back and forth all the time. Hey, so and so is seeing this. That's so important. It's not going to, you know, make a nice publication, but it's really important to build that narrative. So, yeah, I agree with Dave that, you know, we, we should definitely capitalize on that. I have a question um, on the citizen science. So how are you guys uh, QAing what they're telling you? Like, do they go out with you maybe once a year? Do you have a training day or something just to verify that the information you're getting from them is is accurate? Yeah, we have a training with them um, every time. Uh, so there's a training uh, 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 protocol that people have to come to, and we actually kind of show them how it's done. Uh, we had an intern last year that we hired to help train, you know, folks for collecting this data. But once we had people trained, uh, I mean, you can have people that are actually really good, you know, uh, biologists who are kind of like lousy snorkelers, <laughs> you know. So it's I wouldn't suggest that you have to be a professional biologist to collect good data. A macroalgae. The the intent of the program was to have people who care enough to collect good data, and it's really not that hard to do percent coverage, and it's not that hard to stuff everything into a bag, you know, and, and spin it around until the weight stays constant to get a wet weight. So uh, we we use volunteers, and you know, we may be a little bit different because Sarasota's got an awful lot more retirees in Tampa Bay, uh, but we have had no problem at all getting like the majority of our data collected by non you know professional paid biologists. So maybe you do want to have staff do something in addition to what they want to do but don't just limit yourself to that and you know hey use some of the ngos that are around there get folks from like you know uh tampa bay watch gets folks from audubon you know that's what we do we actually reach out to volunteer organizations that already exist and have them uh help collect this data for us and like i said it's all written out in our qapp epa approved it training sessions we seem to be hitting all everything we need to do to collect good data
Well, there's still a couple of comments trickling through the chat, but I do think we need to move on to the next set of topics. So thanks everybody for weighing in on this. Understand that, that it's a conversation that will continue, whether it's through RAMP or the Seagrass Working Group or back here at the TAC again. Um, so it's just a stab at what we don't know so far and where we need to go from there. Um, the next presentation topic is a continuation of something we discussed um, at the last TAC meeting. I just brought it up um, as a casual discussion item at the last TAC meeting, um, which was the potential to reevaluate our study area boundary for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. This is something that has come up periodically over the past couple decades. Um, and it's uh, been raised again by some of our policy board members about the potential to expand our boundaries um, to the west side of Pinellas, uh, St. Joseph Sound, Clearwater Harbor, all the way up um, into additional portions of Pasco County. And so um, y'all provided uh, some feedback at our meeting, basically suggesting uh, that there that there were you know, some it was potentially logical to expand the study area boundary in portions of Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph Sound, and maybe up to Anclote Island, but you all expressed some reservations in terms of uh, the nature of seagrass resources, particularly along the Gulf of Mexico coast in Pasco County. So that information was conveyed to both our management and policy boards at their February meeting. And um, they had a series of robust discussions kind of about that, as well as the CA, the Community Advisory Committee's feedback. Um, but one of the conversation, one of the results of the conversation with our board members was a request um, to, to have a discussion here at this uh, Technical Advisory Committee meeting um, to better understand the data collection and monitoring efforts that are going on in those portions of uh, Pasco and Pinellas counties that, um, that we're considering expanding the boundary into. And basically the idea is we wanna better understand what water quality data and what habitat restoration information is being uh, collected in those, in those areas um, to better understand how they might be integrated in with some of our um, framework for assessing and visualizing data and progress reporting um, for key metrics within the Tampa Bay estuary. So, um, so this conversation, basically, we invited several of the several of the entities who represent um, some of those efforts in the areas that we are considering expansion. Um, and so we have Stacy Day to talk about some of what Pinellas County does in Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph Sound, with respect to water quality monitoring. And then we'll follow that up with Juanita Bernal Leon and Ryan Long from Pasco County to talk about both what they do on the water quality side as well as what they do on the um, the habitat side. So um, we'll let Stacy go first. And Stacy, I'm gonna pass over controls to you. Okay, and I turned off my camera because it was blinking weird. It was okay. <laughs> All right, you should be able to take over controls. Okay, can you see yes. my slide? Yes, okay. in correct presentation mode. Nice, okay. So hi everybody, I'm Stacy Day with Pinellas County um, and I'm gonna tell you about our water quality monitoring and assessment program. Um, we are in the public works department and um, it's the division of environmental management. And let's see if I can get, okay. So our monitoring section is in the environmental management division um, and we have nine environmental scientists in our section. And then we have another eight staff from our other sections that help us out with our monitoring. Um, the Environmental Management Division has about 52 staff and uh, four sections, monitoring, watershed protection, water navigation, ecological services, and air quality. So we do a lot of monitoring, and that's what the focus of this talk is going to be. Um, we, our ambient program, um, we monitor eight times a year, and we're looking at the streams, canals, lakes, and coastal waters. But we also do some other stuff. So we also collect data for special projects. So we have some nutrient source tracking projects going on right now. We help support watershed management plans. And we also have some programs that are focused on restoration. So we have an adopt a pond program that helps citizens um, restore the function of their stormwater ponds. We um, have alum systems that we run in Lake Tarpon and Lake Seminole. We have some living shoreline projects a Florida Friendly Landscaping Incentives pilot program that we're doing for a few years. Um, we've installed some rain gardens and, and just some other 
similar type efforts. And we also are involved in education um, and we're focusing on the sources of pollution and some solutions. Um, so things that we help promote are fertilizer ordinance, proper debris management, lawn care, pet waste disposal, stormwater pond care, riparian buffer zones, and fluorophenly landscaping. And we do this through attending events, hosting events. We host um, at a, a Lakes and Ponds Day once a year. Um, we create and distribute brochures. We have an environmental Facebook page, which I encourage you to take a look at, follow if you are um, so inclined. And we also have a very robust volunteer and intern program. So why do we have a monitoring program with the county? Well, as you are all aware, there's regulations and, and policies. So the Federal Clean Water Act requires that we set standards to assess our water quality and then assess our water quality. Um, and the state MS4 permit we have, um, Pinellas County is a major uh, NPDES discharger. And so we have a permit that requires a monitoring program. And uh, we have a co, the co-permittees on this permit are 22 municipalities, all the municipalities in the county with the exception of St. Pete, they have their own permit. And then FDOT also is part of that permit with us. Um, and then we have 47 TMDLs in our county. And so we're required to assess our progress toward meeting those TMDLs. And then finally, um, the county comprehensive plan um, set a goal of having a monitoring program. Um, as we have kind of talked about earlier this morning, regular long-term monitoring provides baseline conditions so that if we have an event like Piney Point or a hurricane, we can gauge the impact more easily. And then we get a lot of calls from citizens about fish kills or algae blooms, and so we will go out and grab a sample, try to figure out what's going on. If there's a way to address the problem, we will, and then we can also measure improvements in that water quality. So our program is divided into two kind of programs. Um, so we have a coastal program and it's all land-based, or sorry, water-based monitoring. And then we have uh, land-based sites also. So our coastal ambient water quality monitoring program is a probabilistic stratified random design. And um, we started doing this um, monitoring in 2003 and the Janicki group helped us come up with this plan. Um, we sample a total of 32 sites per stratum per year. So basically we looked at all of our coastal open waters and we divided them into 14 different strata. So just basically regions that it made sense to, to kind of put a break point at. So a lot of times it's a bridge. Um, on the west side of the county, we go out to the barrier islands. On the east side in Tampa Bay, we just kind of, we split the bay down our, our uh, jurisdictional lines there. And so with this random design, we, we select four sites per stratum, per sample period, and we monitor eight periods per year, four in the wet season, four in the dry. And you're probably familiar with this type of uh, monitoring. So it's the same thing as EMAP. You have a hexagonal grid that's overlaid on each of your regions, and then you randomly select a sample location within each hexagon per, so that you're only getting one sample per hexagon per year. And again, 32 sites per stratum per year. And then these coastal sites are also stratified by depth. So we get a certain proportion of samples in deeper waters and a certain proportion in shallower waters. And we also alternate our time of day. So sometimes we're getting mon uh, morning samples, sometimes we're getting afternoon samples. Um, and so it's our coastal strata as well as our two big lakes, Lake Tarpon and Lake Seminole have this type of design. Um, we will, we do not monitor St. Pete anymore. We used to, but now they monitor their own waters. So you'll kind of see that we're missing strata right there off the coast of St. Pete, but that's because they're covering that themselves. Um, so this type of monitoring allows statistical confidence in assessing the conditions for that whole region using a smaller number of samples than if you just had fixed sites that need to be sampled more frequently to represent that region. So our land-based water monitoring program, um, we have fixed locations. So this is mostly our streams and canals, and then a couple of our small lakes, uh, Lake Chautauqua and Alligator Lake. And so we have currently 50 fixed sites, and we are sampling 31 different streams. Uh, 12 of these sites are tidal. We, we don't really like to do that, but some of the 
the watersheds, we really didn't have a choice as far as a monitoring site. If, if that is the case, we sample on the lowest outgoing tide because we want to try to represent what's coming off of the watershed. Again, same monitoring periods for wet season for dry. And we try to be at the most downstream location in the watershed because, again, we want to try to characterize what's going on in that watershed. Um, and, if, and some of our watersheds, obviously, we, are, we have more than one site. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's because we have a suspicion that something might be, you know, coming into a stream from a particular location and we want to really try to monitor that. So sometimes it's targeted to a source. So we use, currently we're using um, YSI DSS multi-parameter SANS and we're measuring oxygen, conductivity, salinity, pH, temperature, depth. Um, we're also taking flows so that we can do uh, load calculations. So 18 of our sites, we take the flow manually and then uh, 10 sites, we have a USGS gauge and 10 sites, we have um, a gauge that is also collecting continuous data and that's through Hydrologic Data Inc. Um, but the difference is we can't access that data real time. So USGS, it gets pinged every 15 minutes. Um, HDI, it's cheaper. <laughs> and so we're still able to get continuous data, but we're just, we get that from them quarterly. And then we also do SECI depths on our um, open water sites. We collect grab samples, and those are submitted to our county utilities lab for analysis. And we're looking at the typical parameters, uh, suite of nutrients, chlorophyll, turbidity, TSS, bacteria, BOD, and color. And then we also collect phytoplankton during the warm seasons and uh, transmissivity. And both of those samples are looked at in our in-house lab. And then we also have some extra equipment that we use for um, some special studies. So we do have some EXO SONs that we can deploy to get continuous data over a longer period of time from a week to a month. Um, and this was, um, we have a couple of these buoys that have um, solar power so we can ping the data continuously. Well, I think it's every 15 minutes, but in real time. And this was part of our Fort DeSoto project, looking at circulation of the bridge cuts down there. So our data is used in a variety of ways. Um, first of all, we do upload our data approximately quarterly to WEN, which is the DEP um, database, and they use that for the biannual integrated report where we assess whether waters attain or not the set standards. Um, we also produce an annual report where we look at long-term trends and current impairments, impairment status for all of our waters, um, and that's uh, required by our MPDES permit, so that goes to FDP, just a different group. And then all of our data is also accessible um, through the Water Atlas. And the Water Atlas is pulling our data from when, and then you know, displaying it in a variety of ways. One of the things that we added about a year ago was a, a dashboard, which you can kind of see here on the left side. And it just allows you to look at how the most recent suite of a certain number of parameters, how they performed. Okay, so our long-term trend analysis, this is um, a, an analysis that we pay, we have a contract with Janicki to run for us, so they help us do some of our analyses, um, and they produce these maps for us annually. And so this long-term trend analysis, it's an analysis of data collected since 2003. It's a seasonal Kindle Tau test with autocorrelation correction if necessary. You have to have a minimum of seven years or 60 data points to um, have this analysis um, run. And I'll just show you in 2020, just for nitrogen, and this is run for all of our parameters. So you can see in 2020, 40% of our streams had significantly decreasing TN. Um, none were actually significantly increasing. So that's good. The little, the blue dots just mean no, no significant trend. Um, our lakes had decreasing TN except Alligator Lake. Um, all of our Eastern coastal strata had no significant trends, but all of our West Coast strata have significantly increasing TN trends. So this is concerning, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but you just can see the arrows here. West Coast, everything's up. East Coast, Tampa Bay, no trend. This is just another way to look at the data that 
we put in our annual NPDES report. Um, so this is looking at year by year, how do the water bodies perform um, in relation to the water quality standards? So are they passing or failing? And so I just picked a couple of strata on each side. So old Tampa Bay and the Largo Inlet, which is just right up there by old in Tampa Bay, right below the old smart area. Um, you can see there's a lot of years where chlorophyll exceeds the state standard, but the other parameters are all passing. Um, on the west side, so St. Joseph Sound and the north Clearwater Harbor strata, everything was great until 2017. And then we saw some exceedances of chlorophyll A and nitrogen, and the nitrogen values unfortunately have not gone down since 2017. And this is the same thing, just presented in a different way. So you can kind of see how far above the criteria are we. So again, for St. Joseph Sound and um, Clearwater Harbor North, you know, 2017, 18, and 19, we weren't too far above the criteria, but 2020 was quite a bit farther. And, and we're just now starting to analyze our 2021 data. So we'll see how it looks. But, um, you know, this is the way that we use our data that, um, you know, we're going to be hopefully looking at the causes of, of this in particular. And then switching gears just a little bit on our stream sites, we also do biological monitoring. So um, we do a stream condition index and you look at the macro invertebrates, the habitat in the stream, the algae and the types of nuisance or sensitive vegetation. And in the county, we, we assess 23 streams we consider them appropriate to do this, um, this type of assessment. And you can see six of the 23 are passing the SCI, two of the 23 are passing the habitat assessment, everything passes for algae, surprisingly, um, and then seven of the 23 pass the vegetation survey. The lake vegetation index, uh, we run on six lakes. And again, it's mainly looking at plants. So you survey the lake and look at exotics, sensitives, that type of thing. And four of our six lakes pass. Uh, Tarpon and Alligator Lake are not passing. Um, and and the, these, the stream condition index is done twice a year. So it's done in the fall and in the spring. Um, and I will say, you know, it looks kind of bleak, but, you know, we're a very urban county. And this SCI is set for the whole state pretty much. So, you know, some of the streams that we're being asked to be compared against are, are not experiencing the same conditions that we have here in Pinellas County. So overall, I don't think we're doing too bad. We could do better. We also participate in seagrass monitoring. So we do help TBEP do some fixed sites in Tampa Bay. We also do um, sites in Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph's Sound. And the sites that we do on the west side of the, of the county are probabilist, probabilistic design again. So randomly selected sites we do 40 in St. Joseph Sound, 13 in Clearwater Harbor North, and seven in Clearwater Harbor South. And these are 30 meter transects that we swim along and assess every five meters. And we do the density counts and the blade lengths at zero, 15, and 30 meters. And we just in-house have been starting to analyze some of this. Um, this is just very basic analyses, but you know we can look uh, year to year how our SAV percentages have gone, um, how the different species are in each of the different regions. And you can see that since 2011, we sampled a lot of sites in these regions. We also um, do benthic monitoring. Again, we partner with EPC for Tampa Bay fixed, or the sites that are assigned to us each year. And then um, in Clearwater Harbor, St. Joe's Sound, again, we do that random design and we do 15 sites in St. Joseph's Sound, 16 sites in Clearwater Harbor. And it's the same thing as with EPC. We have a silt clay analysis, sediment chemistry, and then macroinvertebrates or other critters. And again, we just started trying to analyze some of this. Um, and this is just a very quick look at, at how we're trying to look at some of our data from 2018. Um, because of the increasing nitrogen that we're seeing on the whole west coast of our county, um, we are beginning a nitrogen source tracking study. 
And um, so we got a Swift Mud CFI grant and we're going to be starting that. We should have our kick up meet, kickoff meeting in a couple of weeks. And it's gonna be a four year study to try to figure out what is the cause of this increasing nitrogen. Um, and then hopefully, you know, after we kind of figure out some potential sources, we'll also be able to come up with some recommendations to um, improve what, what we're seeing to, to stop the increased nitrogen. And those recommendations will be used to update our CCMP for Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph Sound. We also, as I mentioned earlier, do some other source tracking. So we have a project that should be wrapping up in a few months, um, looking at nutrient um, sources in McKay, Allens, and Curlew Creek. And then we also partner with Pinellas Park to um, do some bacteria uh, monitoring for them in their the Pinellas Park ditches. We also are looking at some groundwater. We have some seepage studies going on in Lake Tarpon and Lake Seminole. So my two cents <laughs> on expanding the TB, TBEP boundaries to include Clearwater Heights and St. Joseph Sound, it shouldn't result in any extra monitoring for the TBEP. Um, the data that we're collecting is being collected under the same rigor, the same or similar methods as the other parts of Tampa Bay. And it would be great to have some collaboration for our new West Coast nitrogen issue. You know, so the, the lessons that we've learned from the Nitrogen Management Consortium and um, so successfully been able to turn that around for Tampa Bay, it'd be great to you know, have you guys, well, to have us be able to use that same type of partnership over on the West Coast of the county. And Boca Ciega Bay, which is part of TBEP, is experiencing these same increases in nitrogen so it would make sense to try to address what's potentially going on as one issue and that is it thanks stacy um i'm gonna turn over controls to juanita next um if you all have any questions we have, maybe have time for like one question while i'm switching them over maya please can can you turn control to ryan the natural resources group first? Uh, I can do that, sorry. How much? Okay, Ryan, you should have the controls. Is he there? I don't know what's going on. We're seeing your um, speaker view. Can you hear us? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Let me get this back to you. All right, can you see everything? We're just seeing it in um, speaker view, like with your notes in the next slide. Let me see. Hmm. Does that work? Yep, that's perfect. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to just give a little bit of overview of our natural resources program. My name is Jackie Jordan. I work with the natural resources regulatory section, and then Ryan's going to present on our um, ELAMP land management. So jumping into our regulatory program, um, we did recently update our regulation website. If you'd like to check it out, we have a presentation on there regarding wetland regulations, living shorelines, and listed species for the general public to um, have additional information. Within our land development code, we have protections for our wetlands. We have our wetland section of the code, specifically for category one wetlands, which would include um, the Gulf of Mexico, wetlands contiguous with the Gulf of Mexico and um, the rivers associated with that, any natural surface water feature, lakes, um, streams, rivers, creeks, 
sinkholes, anything open up to the Florida, Florida aquifer. Also, any wetlands over 100 acres, as well as um, any wetlands that are utilized or critical habitat, habitat for listed species. We also have our rivers section, which would include um, the Pithlachassa Cody, as well as the Anclote Rivers. There is additional setback requirements for those, as well as outstanding Florida waterways. I apologize, our, our fire alarm has been going off all morning, so just bear with us one second. Okay, we're back. Um, so the definitions of our wetland categories are found within our comprehensive plan, and we also do have ecological planning units defined in our comprehensive plan, and we have a coastal marshes EPU, and Ryan's going to touch a little bit more on those. So within our land development code, we're working on updates to improve environmental considerations and regulations for docks, seawalls, living shorelines, and other in-water regulated construction to make sure that the permits we issue are being consistent with state and federal regulations. Um, some of the other things we do, we um, scallop season is open in Pasco County starting the third Friday in July, continuing for 10 days. We will go out on the weekends, our um, natural resources team, and interview boat boaters as they're coming back to two of our county boat ramps and two of our city boat ramps, asking them about um, how many surveys they got, having showing them a map and letting them provide where they got the scallops from just so we can provide that data to FWC. We also do red tide sampling. Um, we started back up the event with last year, and now we have implemented a monthly monitoring program, and then we provide all of those samples to FWRI in St. Pete. Some of our staff on our in our coastal parks have uh, received the stranded mammal, marine mammal training from FWC. We are working on a resilient Pasco living shoreline assessment plan, as well as a coastal restoration and protection plan. Um, we're doing a living shoreline pilot project and that's a part of or that's funded by the coastal partnership initiative from NOAA um, through DEP. So this is just a schematic of where our living shoreline pilot project will be located. We're experiencing erosion along that um, beach within that park. So we'll be planting native vegetation as well as installing an ADA um, Moby mat to allow access down to the beach. Um, this project has been approved by DEP. We're just waiting Army Corps authorization for the Moby mat. And this is just from our red tide sampling last year, um, event last year. And then this is our data form we use that we provide to FWC for the scallop and our boat, boat intercept surveys. And then June 29, um, June 29th, 2020, our Nature Coast Aquatic Preserve was established. Um, it was the 47th. 42nd Aquatic Preserve and the first new one in 32 years. It does have an outstanding Florida water designation, and we are also a part of working on the management plan for that. And some other agency monitoring that occurs within the county, Project Coast Sampling, which has um, 10 sites associated with the Cody River, as well as 10 sites associated with the Anclote River, and um, they test for a variety of um, nutrients. And that Sampling program ran originally from 2000 to 2012, but it restarted in March of 2021 to coincide with the monitoring report for the new aquatic preserve. They also do seagrass monitoring as well, and that was also included in the, um, the 2021 report for um, last year for the aquatic preserve. All right, now I'm going to pass it on to Ryan. Good morning. Um, this is Ryan Long. I am the uh, land management coordinator for uh, Pasco County Environmental Lands and Acquisition Program. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start off with a little bit of a background of, of what we do and how we were established. Um, so we were established in July of 2004 through a referendum. Um, we're funded through a surtax called the Penny for Pasco. Um, that, that Penny for Pasco is only can only be used for acquisition though. So no land management activities um, can technically be used with those funds. Um, and we focus our acquisition um, from a study that was performed called the Assessment of Measure to Protect Wildlife in Pasco County. Um, I believe that document's on our website, um, but it's a pretty extensive study that looked at um, a lot of the high biodiversity um, areas within the county, and then um, some of it determined that 
our corridors were established through following a lot of the major repairing systems. Um, and then we also focus on each ecological planning units, um, which are were also identified uh, of having um, high biodiversity. Um, our ecological corridors is really what we focus on through acquisition. Um, and they really connect exist large tracts of existing public lands. Um, and the next slide, I'll have a map showing a, the overview of what um, what we actually acquire and, and own in Pasco County through ELAMP. Um, ELAMP, so in 2004, we started off with two properties, um, probably less than 100 acres total. And now in 2022, we have, I believe, 40 separate acquisitions and over 6,000 acres that we protect. So this is just a, an overview map of um, Pasco County. Uh, I know there's a lot going on. So the green lines um, that are connecting the different state lands, th those are our corridors. And that's specifically what we try to target through acquisition. And so then everything in red is what we have um, purchased and own. And so when we when we purchase land, we typically strip all the development rights in perpetuity and then also change the future land use um, to con. So it's just kind of a general overview of Pasco County um, and the over 6,000 acres that, that we manage. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but it's like the transparent blue with little like blue dots in it. Those are the EPUs. Um, and uh, we'll f on the next couple of slides, I'll focus on what we actually own and manage um, near the coast. So like I said before, we um, land management activities are not funded through that tax. So a lot of our activities we try to do in-house or um, pursue different funding assistance, um, typically grants we have uh, we have one FCT grant for a coastal property. We have one FERDAP grant for another coastal property. And then we've got a couple of FWC like funding assistant things. Um, we have one that's a um, mangrove restoration grant that just finished up. Um, but we have eight different coastal properties totaling 717 acres on the coast. Um, 584 of those acres fall within the coastal marsh EPU. Um, and the coastal marsh EPU is predominantly wetland, but there are some areas of upland coastal hammock that offer a buffer to those wetland systems. Um, and then, and additionally, there is 608 acres um, currently on our acquisition list that we are, that we are pursuing. And Aside from ELAMP and my program, the county owns an additional 1,028 acres on the coast, and that's predominantly um, our department, which is Parks and Recreation, um, which is which is good. But they don't they don't typically strip development rights or, or you know do a lot of land management activities. Um, so this is side by side. This is kind of these are two maps that I focused on our acquisition on the coast. The map on your left-hand side, again, everything in red is what we have acquired and manage. Um, and that's, like I said, approximately 717 acres. Um, everything in orange is on our acquisition list and we are pursuing um, acquisition for those properties. Now, whether the seller, we can't find a middle ground in price or there are some stipulations is, is depends on if we actually acquire it. Um, and then in purple is the other um, county owned properties. The right hand map, I just overlaid what the coastal marsh EPU is um, just so you could get an idea of the acreage that's within that ecological planning unit. Um, some of the land management techniques that we use um, 
you, invasive is probably the biggest thing that we that we do. Um, I have a team of five for the six thousand acres, so you know doing things in house sometimes is is tough, but we do the best that we can. And Brazilian peppers are is a real issue on our coastal pieces. Um, so we try to, you know, like I said, get grants or volunteers or working groups to help kind of control some of that. We've also partnered with, um, UF IFAS. Um, they have a species of thrip that is a new biocontrol for Brazilian pepper. Um, they've released on a, a property of ours and unfortunately that was done before COVID. So, um, we, we I don't think a lot of data was actually, um, was, was derived from that release, but I'm in contact with them again, and hopefully we can get that going. Um, we do some of our habitat restoration is a lot of just um, getting rid of invasives, allowing for natural recruitment. Um, if we do have a grant associated with that property, we adhere to whatever stipulations are in that grant, um, whether it be mangrove restoration or, or things of that nature. We do wildlife surveys, which are very passive. Um, they're simply present in absent surveys for the most part, unless otherwise, um, unless we have to do something a little bit more for the, if there's a grant on that property. Vegetation surveys, same thing as wildlife. Um, we do belt transects, uh, photo monitoring, um, things of that nature. Um, we haven't got, we do have um, prescribed fire plans for most of the properties now because it's there's such an urban interface on some of these properties we haven't got we haven't got to burn them on a, a regular interval that we'd like to but i'm working with forestry to kind of see if we can get some fire breaks on that urban interface so that we can burn more frequently um, other than that you know, the normal stuff trail maintenance um, we have volunteers for trash cleanup debris um, we perform educational events uh, i believe six times a year on some of the properties um, and then just any, any type of amenity on, on our property, we, we upkeep and that's it. Did you have any questions for natural resources? Not seeing any questions pop up. I'm not sure if I should put it on presentation so it, it goes to presentation immediately. And hold on, let me give you controls when you know. Oh, where is this? See, I did something wrong. So do you all, um, Ryan, do you all map your acreages um, and do regular so do you map the the, the habitat type acreages kind of like we were talking about earlier with the habitat master plan scorecard and then okay. do, you, do you report regularly on the restoration activities that that you do that you conduct on your property so we have we have maps and shape files for you know every property and every land use land cover that elamp um, manages um Depending on if there is a grant or some type of monitoring requirements, we may have that data, but at least on our coastal pieces, we haven't done a whole lot of really diving into the data to figure out, you know, how much, you know, natural mangrove recruitment there's been and, and, and that sort of thing. Okay, Juanita, we see your screen. Okay, that sounds great. Are you seeing it in presentation view? Yep, it's just as it should be. Okay, perfect. Okay, so basically uh, I'm gonna start saying that all the activities and uh, the tasks that we develop actually are reflected in our strategic plan, uh, which was currently updated just recently and uh, it's now current for years 2022 to through to 2025. So uh, the focus areas in which we have specific goals that we are meeting with the activities that we are accomplishing 
uh, are highlighted there. One of the focus areas is create a thriving community. There's a goal there, goal 1.4, incorporate sustainable practices into the development and redevelopment of Pasco communities. Uh, the other focus area is the enhance of quality of life. Uh, we have two goals there that we are approaching. Goal 2-3, provide cultural, educational, recreational, and social opportunities in Pasco County to improve overall quality of life. And goal 2-4, protect, conserve, manage, and restore the county's natural resources, including land, water, and wildlife habitat. Sorry, I did. So uh, the next slide I want to show uh, in different colors, the coastal watersheds in, in, in Pasco. So basically on the south side, we have the Antwood River, which actually is split into two, the east and west. Uh, the lower coastal, which is basically on the southwestern side. Um, more to the middle of the coast, we have the Port Ritchie watershed where the city of Port Ritchie is sitting right now. Double hammock uh, and up in the Northwest Hammock Creek. Uh, then kind of in the middle, we have the, the Cody, the Pitlachus Cody River and the Bear Creek, which actually are two different watersheds, but they are interconnected. So that's why um, it's showing in just one screen. Okay, so uh, we do have a water quality monitoring. Uh, we are basically reaching goals 1-4 and 2-4. And, and here what I'm showing is we have different stations in the, and this is basically to comply with the MS4 permit. Uh, so we have water quality stations in Bear Creek. We have a water quality station in the Pitlachascote River. Uh, we have two stations in the Antlet River, one in the east uh, watershed and one in the uh, west side. Uh, here, the, here's the one on, on the Antlet River west, and right here is the Pitlachascote River. Uh, we also have a station. Uh, the city of the city of Newport Ritchie actually is uh, has a, a station also in the Pitlachascote River, and the city of Port Ritchie has another one almost uh, in, on the discharge to the Gulf. Uh, here is the Bear Creek station located. Um, and besides this, uh, the project coast, as, as Chris was mentioning in the, ch in the chat, uh, has been in place since 2012. And uh, the yellow dots are showing where these locations are. There are also other uh, sampling efforts in the salt springs uh, spring, which is which is done by the strategic monitoring plan. This is a station that was um, recently reinstated by the state uh, to grab samples in there too. So our ambient monitoring program, actually um, we grab samples monthly. Um, the parameters that we measure there are BOD, DO, pH, conductivity, temperature, turbidity, total solids, uh, total nitrogen, uh, chlorophyll A, total phosphorus, nitrates and nitrates, zinc, copper, total hardness, and bacteria. Um, as an NPDES requirement, we upload this data quarterly to the WIN state database. We also have some real-time state discharges uh, through the USGS. We have an interlocal agreement with them. We have gauging stations at the same locations where we have the water quality monitoring stations. All this data is um, introduced in our, in our MS4 report, annual report, and we track, we have data since 2007 when we started this program. Uh, the cities uh, were just recently starting in 2018. We keep track of the information, um, the analysis that are, that are done are, are basically uh, shown in graphs like the ones you are seeing here. Uh, we, we track the water quality to see if actually we are in compliance. 
with the regulatory standard. And we provide all this information to DEP for long-term assessments and short-term assessments showing every, every quarter uh, the, the summary information that we provide. So these are just examples of the trends that we have for E. coli, for example, and for chlorophyll A. But we have all this information for every single parameter and for every single station through the county. We are also a stakeholder in the, we are part of the Spring Coast BMAP. Uh, currently, there is a section of the Wikiwachi Spring and River watershed that falls into, into the, the north side, the northwest side of the county. Uh, this BMAP was adopted in June 2018. So as a stakeholder, we are committed to providing public education, uh, adopting a pet waste ordinance, and studying and planning for septic to sewer conversions in this area. Uh, we have an issue of fecal pollution going on at Hudson Beach. Uh, this was a verified impairment for bacteria with multiple beach closures every year. Um, so since 2009, we have been um, developing a study to identify potential sources of the fecal pollution that's going on. Uh, the results of the study that included um, microbial source tracking indi indicated that the pollution may come from human sewage, from the waste water lines that are nearby the coast, um, some stormwater inputs that following the rainfall events. And there were some remedi remediation efforts that we uh, went through in 2015. We repaired some leaking into the sewer pipes that we actually discovered through the CCTV inspections. There was a lift station that was retrofitted. Um, we also retrofitted in 2018 a stormwater pond uh, by changing the underdrain filtration system. However, the continued monitoring is showing that uh, the water quality continues to degrade. So we are, uh, we know we have we need additional efforts here. So. Uh, just recently this year, we started an, another phase of the study to compile all the historical water quality data. And we are looking for some funding to develop a plan for future sampling and future studies, which we will hopefully perform in fiscal year 23. Um, we participate in several stakehold, stakeholder meetings across the region and across the, straight, uh, the state. So we attend DEP strategic monitoring uh, plan, the Nature Coast Aquatic Preserve. Uh, we are part also of the Hillsborough River BMAP. We attend quarterly meetings with DEP. As I mentioned, we are part of the stakeholders in the Wikiwachi BMAP. We are part, Pasco County is part of the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. So besides attending the council itself and its meetings, uh, we attend the Stormwater Education Committee. We are part, as you know, of the management and the policy board of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Uh, we attend the MS4 quarterly teleconferences with DEP. And of course, we attend the TMDL planning and stakeholder meetings through the state. And basically, that's what we wanted to share with you. All right, thank you very much. So is there any comments or questions about um, the information that was presented on the supplementary monitoring that's available for these areas that are currently outside of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program watershed? Hey, Maya, I just want to make a quick, quick comment. I, I'm, uh, uh, I've been typing in the chat. I apologize for the confusion about Project Coast. It's, it's, it's been kind of a circuitous adventure since 1998, but the coast data offshore from Pasco up to uh, Citrus County has been uh, monitored since 1998. So we, uh, it, was, it, it has always been a district funded uh, initiative up until the, this most recent um, uh, thing that, that UF is doing, but, but we funded it with UF, Tom Frazier's lab at the time did the work. And then in 2012, we brought that project in house and have been uh, sampling 
uh, with district staff and, and a, the district water quality lab sent. So just sorry about the, the confusion, but just in case everybody was uh, wondering, the, the data actually go back much further than 2012. It goes back to 1998. And there's several uh, reports that were published over the years on that. So if anybody has any interest in those reports, I can get you guys copies of those. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Ed? No, I just, I don't know if my cam turned on completely, but, you know, no, this is the opportunity to, sorry? Your camera's not on. It's black. So this is the opportunity for the TAC to ask questions. You know, we're providing this information to the Technical Advisory Committee for your input to each of the entities. It uh, seems like there's complementary monitoring programs being pursued by both parties. And it's really a question of, for us, you know, what is, why, what what benefit do the counties perceive would, would be um, gained if, if we expanded our boundaries into those areas over and above what you guys are currently doing? And, and how does that influence our, our decision making decision making as we present this to our policy board for all the other you know, activities we're pursuing in the Bay proper and and the resources we have available now how would that that effort if we expand into these new geographic boundaries be complemented with with all these other ongoing efforts and focus in Tampa Bay so it's kind of a two-part question first for the TAC if, to see if they had any other uh, considerations or questions on for each of the entities for these new boundary areas and secondarily for each of the, the entities you know what what is the added value you all see you know in the estuary programs boundaries expanding into into the areas you're currently monitoring and and actively doing work in ed it's mark schramick with national marine fisheries can you hear me Hi, hey, great venue. Um, so I have a quick question for Ryan. Ryan, it wasn't clear to me about the the map that you had put up. It looked like there were a number of coastal land acquisition um, parcels along the the coast there in in Pasco County. Can you just remind me? Speak to what the purpose is for that for land acquisition. Is it just coastal resiliency? Um, future development activities, just kind of curious. Thank you. Yeah, so it's it's for resiliency and, you know, just basically um, not allowing that land to be developed, um, essentially. And so we have eight properties currently um, on the coast, about 700 acres, um, and we strip the land of any type of development in perpetuity. So really, you know, we're limiting um, what can be developed and then with whatever restoration efforts um, and additional funding that we, we seek, we try to restore the properties to the to the best of, of our ability. Thank you, Ryan. And, and they're a combination of both wetlands and upland habitats. Is that a fair assumption? Yes. Um, so for the most part, um, they are tidal flats, salt marshes, mangrove swamp, and then in the very north um, west property is called Arapika Sand Hills. There's a, um, a sand hill habitat type component to it as well. Okay, good, good to know. I mean, in the context of, you know, coastal resiliency and sea level rise and climate change, I think it is important you know, that, that coastal communities and counties do identify these types of areas, just particularly uplands, because I think with the transition from, you know, current wetland areas that will eventually over time through sea level rise and climate change transition um, into these upland areas, it's important to have areas that for those habitats to retreat to. But with that, that that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the I think the relevant thing for this discussion is that you know it's great that Pasco County and you know Pinellas County have these have these other efforts in place. I think that the question that's put before us by some of our policy board members is, um, 
you know, if if we were to incorporate and extend the boundary of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, what data are, what data are available um, for us to incorporate things like modifying the goals of the Habitat Master Plan to include this new geography? How does that change our our targets for salt marsh restoration? Um, you know, it's so you know those great things that Pasco County are doing that's happening, um, and and we you know we support all of that work. It's this que this question of um, if we fold them into the boundary of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, how do we incorporate all of this in the, the work and the resources that the Estuary brings to be Estuary Program brings to bear, uh, which is more of these sort of like status and trends reporting, um, some some potential funding streams, um, albeit relatively small, um, those those sorts of things. So that's that's sort of what we're um, vetting and trying to discuss through this group and others. Um, but we are running short on time, so um, I kind of want to cut this discussion um, short. And if you have other thoughts, feel free to reach out to Ed or I, um, give us a call or shoot us an email, or you can feel free to put anything um, in, the, in the chat as well. Marcus, keep it really, really short, okay? I'll try my best. Uh, so each year we, we uh, solicit special study sites from the TAC to see um, where we could do some uh, supplemental benthic monitoring through EPC. And so it's that special time of year. <clears throat> um, I'll keep it brief. Um, you know, each year we do routine monitoring, but we get 20 special sites where we could just basically pick where to supplement some um, additional effort to answer questions of interest. Um, this is just a list of, of where past sites have been. Uh, briefly, last year was Piney Point, obviously. The year before that was um, some PFOS sampling with T-BERF and then uh, Pinellas Point Tire Field, and, and you can kind of see the uh, the rest of the, uh, the sites that were sampled in years prior. So at this point, we're asking for feedback on where we should go this year uh, for special study sites. <clears throat> um, you know, we're thinking, obviously, revisiting Piney Point. Uh, revisiting the Pinellas Point Tire Reef, and then possibly, if if there's um, enough sites left, uh, some sampling at a, a restoration site, a shoreline, uh, living shoreline site uh, on the Cay Bay at DeSoto Park. Uh, so we only have 20. Um, at this point, we're, we're thinking Piney Point and the, the Tire Reef for sure, um, and we'll probably do that unless we hear otherwise or there's strong interest to do the uh, living shoreline um, restoration at DeSoto Park. So. Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. And Roger's problem area is an OTB. If you have specific locations, Roger, in mind, um, please uh, get in touch with me offline and, and we can we can discuss that. Yeah, I think when for the PFAS study, we did some sites like in the Feather Sound, um, Feather Sound area. So yeah, that that and potentially the muck accumulation depositional areas. Okay. Hey, Marcus, this is Chris with EPC. I I agree with revisiting Piney Point and the uh, Pinellas Point Tire Reef. I think those are important to follow up on. Okay. Hey, we agree to this is brandon um would the distribution I, I i agree with those priorities as well um and i would think distribution would be weighted towards piney point more as far as not if you got 20 to divvy out what's what's that breakdown yeah, I mean, well, there was 10 original, well, actually all of the special study sites last year were Piney Point, so 10 in April and then 10 again in September. So um, I think it would probably just be one sampling in the fall, uh, obviously, this year. So we could do 10 again, uh, September time frame at Piney Point, and then allocate the rest um, either the, the tire reef or some problem areas in OTB um, or elsewhere. But um, we'll, we'll get that figured out and get the sites to you ASAP. Okay, any other thoughts, you can email Marcus directly. Um, Ed, I'm gonna skip your, your topic for the moment. Um, if people wanna stay on to talk about that, they can. I do just wanna remind everybody that while we're later in getting this interim CCMP update going than we hoped, um, we will be kicking that work off 
um, over the summer time period. I know I've heard from several of you about the research and monitoring priorities. Um, I don't know if Amy or Shannon are able to um, unmute, but they are. I did hear from them in particular about some needs with respect to microplastics monitoring. Um, so I wanted to invite them to be able to share uh, their thoughts. Thanks, Maya. I just have a couple of minutes before we have to head to another meeting. But we had just reviewed the, the CCMP with an eye for microplastics monitoring. We've been running a monitoring program out of Eckerd, started with TBER funding since 2017. And um, there are a number of needs that we see throughout the CCMP related to microplastics monitoring related to wastewater, um, related to also, um, so wastewater discharge, um, stormwater discharge, and then also within the contaminants of concern uh, actions. And we can share those via email with the TAC and would be happy to chat about them further uh, down the road, but we both do need to attend another meeting right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> You muted, Maya. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements, and then for those of you who are able to stay on and chat about temperature logging and shallow seagrass flats, um, we'll hit that topic last. Um, I just wanted to run a couple of ideas um, by y'all. One is uh, I see a lot of folks are more and more active on LinkedIn, and I, I know that um, we share a lot internally in terms of scientific publications or um, job opportunities and things like that um, on a more real-time basis um, internally at the estuary program. And so I wondered if there might be interest from the technical advisory committee to have a group on LinkedIn where folks could come and share that stuff directly rather than getting it like, you know, through me as a conduit. So I've created a, a group on there and I'm kind of interested to, you know, know if y'all think that might be something you're interested in or not. If it if if it doesn't get interest or whatever, that's fine. Um, but I just wanted to talk about that as a possibility. There's a link to the group um, in the agenda. Basis proceedings. If you presented it basis, you have to write a paper. It doesn't have to be long. Uh, <laughs> but it is due on June 30th. Uh, please submit it to Marcus. Um, if you have questions about how to approach that, I'm sure he'd be happy to give you some suggestions, but it's really important that we commemorate everything and all the talks that were shared at BASIS. Um, you see today even we're referring to and sharing um, work that was shared at prior BASIS meetings. Um, it is really important our future selves and our successors will thank us. So get those papers in to Marcus. Um, and then hopefully you all have seen the job ads, but we're currently hiring for two positions. We're hiring a restoration ecologist position as well as an administrative specialist position. The ads are linked in the agenda. Um, please share those within your networks or if you're interested in applying, uh, please consider it. We would love to have you um, potentially join our team. With that, Ed, I will turn it over to you to discuss the temperature logging in seagrass flats. This is, came, in, came out of work that uh, Roger Johansson did for us in developing a bio-optical model and looking at some of the water quality information at a finer scale in some of the seagrass management areas, particularly in old Tampa Bay. And I think he uh, observed some summertime trends of increasing temperatures, uh, especially of areas where we've lost seagrass, and he expressed an interest in potentially uh, deploying some continuous temperature loggers in these seagrass flats uh, just to collect some baseline information. And I believe he's already started doing that in some areas um, around North Shore Beach. So the question becomes whether or not we expand this effort to other areas in Tampa Bay, and there's opportunity to borrow some equipment from each of the partners or uh, look at ways we can leverage monitoring resources to get a better understanding of shallow seagrass flat temperature uh, trends. And if that's of value to the region, I will, you know, that's what we're posing the question right now to see if that expended effort is uh, of benefit uh, for
course, some of the questions we have about the persistence of seagrass, particularly in areas that might be becoming more temperature stressed. So that's, that's the primary question. Secondary question is sort of these ancillary goals that we have as an estuary program working with the Regional Resiliency Coalition of identifying um, uh, temperature uh, conditions that, and indicators of, of problems associated with increasing temperatures for, for certain biological ecological processes in the Bay. Um, there are some continuous uh, temperature uh, data being collected both um, from uh, air instrumentation as well as in-water instrumentation that in the deeper portions associated with some of the co-ops and port sites. So it's a matter of whether or not this additional monitoring, if, if folks felt there was value in this additional monitoring to get a better understanding of shallow water temperature trends. So I'll, I'll stop there as an introduction and, and let others expand upon it. Um, I first want to just gauge whether or not uh, others in the technical advisory committee felt this was a, a priority that we should be focusing effort and attention towards. Ed, hey, um, so I, I remember reading the, the initial report that, that Roger did. It's, it's a great body of work. Um, my, my question is, though, in terms of temperature stress, so the hypothesis here is that the temperatures have increased in the shallow seagrass areas to where we think that there it's it's become too uh, or or that it, it is a sublethal stress on the grass is that is that kind of the thrust of why we're monitoring those temperatures out there can you hear me? The, the, yeah roger go ahead yeah uh, there are more and more papers being published about uh events uh, they call them estuary in heat waves and in many areas uh, in around the world they have found that that's a big stress on on seagrasses so we don't really have any good information uh, on uh, the shallow water temperatures and i just uh, uh, i, I uh, lo start logging uh, seagrass temperatures at North Shore Park, and uh, I compared that to the air temperature and the two sensors that uh, NOAA has at the, in the water uh, near that area. And I didn't really find any good relationship between any of those compared to what I found from the uh, shallow water uh, sensor. And Roger, remind me, you're, you're placing how many sensors in the water is it just one or at what and at what depths this is just a test i bought a uh 60 dollar hobo uh, okay just to see how, how things look like at the, at least one location okay the, the uh the, the sensor is placed in a uh syringodium and a halodula bed okay thank you Hey, this is Brandon. Um, there's some of the work that I've seen on the on the thermal effects, especially some of the sublethal stuff. There's there's a good amount of information kind of internationally from power plant discharge studies, um, and I know there have been. Uh, studies done in Tampa Bay, uh, like the Bartow plant at Whedon Island. Um, it's of course stuff that's not published is, can be, uh, difficult to obtain the data is there, but most likely they were conducted as part of uh, permit compliance. So it should be available, but it can take some digging, but I think that would, could be a certainly a source of at least anecdotal information if we're looking to apply, you know, prior studies to maybe design some work here. Yeah, particularly if uh, those reports indicated some 
threshold values or sublethal threshold values of which we could potentially direct some monitoring effort to understanding in the shallow flat areas where, where we don't have persistent seagrass beds. So um, I'll, I'll talk to you offline if there's potential ways to access some of that information. Yeah, sounds good. I think also, Roger, it's it's good too to look at the flip side of that, which is the the winter temperatures. Because as I think Dave was talking about this earlier, that you know one one of the phenomena that you know could be affecting uh, to Mike Wessel's point, you know, nutrient cycling is that the bay is not getting as cold as it used to. So it may not you know when you look at high temperatures or you look at maximum temperatures, it may not be all that different from what it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, but there's no doubt about it because the, the air temperature reflects the same thing that the weather conditions have gotten less cold. And so, you know, from a, from a growing season standpoint that might benefit seagrass, but it also benefits epiphytic algae and macroalgae and, and potentially phytoplankton in the water columns. So, I think it's good too to look at it from that perspective. If there's a way to either infer or if data goes back far enough to look at what the minimum water temps might have been, you know, decades ago. I don't know if, if you know, you guys probably collected that stuff back in the day. Um, might be interesting just to look at that, look at it from the other perspective, which is, you know, are we less cold than we were 20, 30, 40 years ago? Marcus has done some initial analyses with some of the long-term ambient data, and I think the interest that Roger has expressed is, is more of the continuous information of, of understanding the, the stress during the growing season on some of these seagrass flat areas. And, and I guess the question I have is whether or not, you know, all it's going to take is an initial pilot scale monitoring to make some correlations with some of the other sensor information. It sounds like Roger's that you don't feel that's the case in terms of the data you collected so far with in terms of correlation of the shallow seagrass temps versus other deeper water monitoring data that's available. I can share some slides from uh, the, the earliest uh, information I collected if you want to see those. Okay. You have them ready? Yeah, I can. I think I. Just made them presenter my. Can you see that? Yeah, this is a comparison between the, my sensor. It's at uh, about 0.7 meter deep water, and uh, air temperature is in Petersburg, the airport. And uh, let's see if I get this one. And this comparison, the blue line is the sensor temperatures, and uh, the other two lines are NOAA uh, water temperature sensors. So see, we don't really have a go, good information on uh, what uh, appears to occur in the uh, seagrass beds. So just looking at this graph, Roger, um, it looks like just over that short period, your maximum temperature was, uh, what, sometime in June at about 32 degrees yes yes uh, and uh, 33 degrees have been a uh, uh, shown as a, a potential uh, lethal temperature down in the florida bay okay cool okay yeah because that was going to be my next question Well, yeah, I mean, I think this is worthwhile. I think this is good information. And, you know, if this summer 
if La Nina holds and, and you know, we do continue to see, I mean, we already see just on a synoptics level and we're above, above average in terms of sea surface temperature in the region. So this might be a good year to, to do this or, or good, you know, next few months anyway. Any other, I know we're holding you over about 15 minutes past noon. Uh, any other thoughts or conversation on this topic? It could be a citizen's uh, monitoring program effort. Uh, it's pretty simple to put these sensors out there and collect the data every week or so. Yeah, I would agree right now, with that. Right? Those, if we, those hobos are pretty cheap and pretty easy to, um, you know, to get data from. And um, I know some similar to some uh, community efforts to monitor air quality, uh, you know, separately, that's a separate topic, but the, the little hobo sim sensors are, would be, I think, very conducive to some citizen science to put, deploy and collect. I agree on that. More dad is better, right? Right. <laughs> That's what we're here. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people are interested in their seagrasses right outside their docks, and so it might be somebody would uh, sign up. All right. Well, I think I think we got the feedback we were looking for. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, just turn away. <laughs> Had a plan for this. Is there any other thing we need to discuss, Maya? You're muted. Is Natasha still on? Um, or did she leave? I'll send out. She's got a survey link she wants me to send out. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, yeah, just with some of the talks today, we're doing a info gathering on regional HAB and phytoplankton monitoring, uh, basically from the stance of what are people doing, what kind of info do they have available, and um, if they're interested in potentially coordinating uh, for FWC display or something like that for public knowledge and education. So you can take a moment to take that um, and give your contact info if you're interested. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks. Anything else from the group? Otherwise, the next TAC meeting is scheduled for October 19th. If you have a project that you'd like to share, please reach out to me. I would love to feature what you've got going on. Thanks, y'all. Hey, guys, I, I, I just had one real quick thing. Um, we were out yesterday um, off of Pinellas Point, and uh, we were doing our, our seagrass uh, field verification work, and we found five live scallops in that area. And they looked pretty happy, as did the seagrass. So just wanted to pass that along. And I didn't know also for the group, um, I didn't know, it, are, are we, is there a reporting mechanism for us? Because we have the coordinates for where those scallops were found. Is, is FWRI?